uh, welcome to uh, our information meeting. Uh, this information meeting tonight is on uh, Baker Commodities uh, odors, uh, reports, and uh, discussion. And uh, so I'd like to just uh, uh, make a couple of uh, comments and then uh, I'll also uh, introduce our, our panel and then we'll uh, get into some uh, overviews and uh, information as you've seen on the agenda. There's extra agendas uh, on the table if uh, you have them. And again, this is uh, an information meeting. We are recording it. Uh, and uh, typically within our, our uh, form and fashion that uh, we push this up uh, to our website uh, within about 48 hours. And uh, it's available. Uh, anyone can go online. Uh, but uh, it is live. This is a live session tonight. Uh, and it is, uh, again, being recorded so that it can be utilized uh, on the website uh, overall. Um, uh, for those that may not know me, I'm Tony LaFountain, Penfield Town Supervisor. Uh, tonight uh, we have uh, Bill uh, Schmieder, who is the General Manager uh, from Baker Commodities. Uh, we have the uh, Director of Region 8, uh, Paul J. Uh, Diamato. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, Dr. Byron Kennedy from the Monroe County uh, Health Department. Um, the intent of tonight's meeting is uh, really driven out of the fact that uh, you know, this board heard a number of months ago an opportunity uh, certainly to uh, get uh, our arms around uh, odors uh, uh, that uh, were coming from Baker into uh, the neighborhood and that neighborhood of, uh, of uh, Parkview, Woodhaven, uh, up into Reginald Circle, Old Westfall Road. And um, so uh, to date, um, uh, we have had um, 59 uh, different uh, days uh, where there uh, has been uh, odor complaints in 2014. Uh, and I'll just briefly highlight those. Uh, six in January, two in February, three in March, uh, nothing in April, uh, six in May, 10 in June, 15 in July, 10 in August, six in September, uh, none in October, and uh, one uh, for November. Uh, that is uh, 59 different days that uh, odors were reported uh, and a total of 152 uh, different individuals that uh, reported odors on those uh, various uh, 59 days. Um, and at uh, our town board meeting in July, uh, the board uh, was uh, presented uh, with a petition. Uh, the board uh, wanted to uh, hold a public information meeting where we had all of the parties uh, that uh, uh, are part of this this uh, uh, whole issue uh, that uh, has come up, certainly uh, Baker Commodities uh, as the, the operator, uh, the DEC, um, Health Department, and of course the town. And, and I would just like to recognize that uh, we do have uh, three of our town board members, uh, President Rob Quinn, Andy Moore, Paula Metzler, uh, Linda Cole uh, is uh, where she should be, which is uh, watching uh, one of the last performances of her daughter's college career. Um, and uh, so she is there uh, watching that event this, uh, this evening. Um, uh, the format tonight is, is we're going to give everyone an opportunity to, uh, to make uh, some uh, comments. Um, once we've uh, completed that, uh, then we'll get to uh, a Q&A session. Uh, if you have uh, signed up, I've got a handful right here. If you've signed up, uh, great. Uh, if you have not signed up, uh, once we've gone through those that have signed up, you'll have an opportunity to, uh, to speak after that. And uh, the goal is to get to every one-time speaker before we go back and uh, go through the route of uh, second or third uh, comments uh, overall. Uh, so again, uh, the intent tonight is uh, to uh, hopefully learn together things that uh, are going on, have gone on, and uh, some things that uh, have uh, been done uh, to help uh, with this uh, whole situation, and also to uh, answer those uh, questions uh, that uh, anyone has. Uh, and uh, I think we've got all the right uh, people uh, here or uh, some, of the, uh, some of their uh, support uh, staff uh, to help uh, answer those questions as well. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I would uh, like to reintroduce uh, Bill Schmieder. Uh, Bill, as I've mentioned, is the general manager of uh, Baker Commodities uh, here locally. Uh, their corporate headquarters uh, is in California. And uh, I thought it would be good for Bill to give us an overview of uh, some things that have been going on by way of the uh, SCP uh, report uh, or inspection and then follow-up report. 
um, and some work that uh, has been going on uh, at that uh, at the plant. So with that, uh, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, as Tony said, uh, I'm Bill Schmieder, the general manager of uh, Baker Commodities in Rochester, New York. Uh, our corporate office is located in Vernon, California. We've got about eight rendering plants. We represent about 15 states uh, within uh, the United States. And this, this business, or this uh, company is a, uh, a family-owned business, and it's really one of the nation's leading providers of rendering and grease removal services since 1937. Um, <clears throat> a little, little history on rendering. Baker uh, is a completely sustainable company recycling materials from dairy and poultry farming. Uh, we pick up grocery stores, food processing, uh, and, and we provide a service for the restaurant industry as well. <clears throat> there are, with these raw materials that come into our facility, there are no chemical additives uh, to any of these uh, food byproducts. Rendering is a safe and essential link to the food industry and to the environment. Uh, rendering finished uh, products are ingredients in pet and livestock <clears throat> feeds and soaps, lubricants, and biofuels. Um, rendering is one of the most environmentally and economically sound ways to handle uh, methods to handle this recycling of waste products. And, and this material is collected at our facility daily and it's processed, <coughs> excuse me, it's processed daily. Once the trucks come into the yard, they hit the scale, and from the scale they go right inside to enclosed buildings that are that are treated for odor abatement. <coughs> and then and then they're uh, they're they're processed uh, shortly thereafter. Um, we have scrubbers in place, uh, the, but to to treat the odors uh, that the dew are associated with this material. Uh, the, the material then begins its process, um, rendering process, through size reduction, traveling through a totally enclosed, high temperature continuous cooker to flash off the moisture in this material. And most of that material contains about 55% moisture. Now this pro process requir requires a large amount of steam as the heating and cooking source. And once the material is thoroughly cooked, uh, it goes to further processing and then for testing, grinding, and, and storage. Um, and in each stage of this processing, there are high intensity odors. And these high intensity odors are captured and treated in a thermal oxidizer, uh, which is really a boiler that heats the odors to about 1400 degrees Fahrenheit and it treats those odors. From there, that air is, uh, uh, goes, ex ex exits the building through a stack and, and then into the atmosphere. The lower intensity odors, which basically is room air, and that's collected by the air scrubbers that we have in the facility that draws a negative pressure uh, in, in our rendering rooms, and the air is treated in those air scrubbers. Now in July, and obviously there's history here, but in July of 2011, we had some extremely high temperatures that caused some of the raw materials to abnormally degrade and created odor abatement difficulties with the air scrubbers. The air scrubbing solution is sodium hypochlorite or chlorine, and that didn't effectively treat those, those stronger, stronger odors from that, from that rendering material. After that occurrence, it was recommended and determined that a review of alternate air scrubber solution, which was chlorine dioxide, and has been a very successful solution for many, many years in this country in many rendering plants as well as Baker Commodities. Uh, now these rendering plants are also situated in heavily popula populated residential areas. And what we decided was uh, to set up a test program and that was set up with the chlorine dioxide and a service contractor. Uh, and the service contractor had many years of experience with the rendering uh, plant air scrubbers. So in 2011 and in 2012, uh, Baker and the service con contractor had set up portable test programs to determine the efficiency of the operations uh, and what we could expect with, the, uh, with this chlorine dioxide. Um, and as you can expect and as we talked about many times, that we had expected uh, and experienced uh, startup complications as a result of the many calibrations in f uh, for this solution for the flow rates for high and low settings of uh, the oxidation 
reduction potential or ORP levels. And, uh, and there was a lot of training and some routine maintenance that went, went along with these programs as well, test programs. Now we came out of 2012, we were pretty confident that a system designed specifically for our facility would uh, perform well uh, at Baker's. And the service contractor and the rendering industry st standards had also proven that uh, to, to be a fact. The rendering equipment, uh, or the, uh, the equipment was ordered and we began all the necessary plumbing, electrical and construction work to accommodate the installation and start up uh, that was scheduled for June of 2013. The decision to purchase and change the air scrubber solution and equipment was solely the purpose of reducing odors and this project was not initiated as a cost of saving effort. The startup in 2013 began as expected with additional calibrations and additional training and all of the scrubbers were now plumbed to this new uh, scrubber solution system instead of just the one that we had done for the, t for the pilot program. As the year went on, and we were hopeful of becoming more confident that the new equipment and the contractor would increase the efficiency of the air scrubber odor control system. However, uh, there continued to be upsets with the equipment, with the calibrations, <clears throat> and with, the limit, with limited results in efficiency and effectiveness of the air scrubber solution system. On September 15th and 16th of this year, 2014, an air scrubber order consultant from SCP Controls had visited our rendering facility for the purpose of reviewing the odor control air scrubbers. The rendering industry nationwide has and continues to rely on SCP Controls for odor abatement solutions, recommendations, purchases, and installations. SCP came up uh, with this inspection of all three scrubbers uh, that had resulted in 10 recommendations which Baker had completed the majority of repairs immediately. After continued consultation and review with SCP, it was decided to discontinue the use of the new chlorine di dioxide system as an air scrubbing solution and change back to sodium hypochlorite. So on September 17, 2014, that's exactly what we did. When this decision was made, we again asked SCP controls for recommendations for an improved and more automated control system and monitors to achieve the higher level of odor control with the sodium hypochlorite solution. SCP recommendations have been made, reviewed by Baker, and approved for purchase. <clears throat> this will include new scrubber solution monitors and controllers, new sodium hypochlorite metering pumps, new flow meters, and, and with a mag-style flow sensors for each of the three air scrubbers. We will also purchase new recorders, which will allow us to record ORP, pH, and scrubber solution flow levels. The new control panel will have the ability to email an alarm when flow of air scrubber solution falls below a set point. We do feel more comfortable with our commitment of reducing the odor levels and we do feel we'll be successful at that, especially with the many years of experience that we've previously had with sodium hypochlorite. And the addition of the new air scrubber controllers, monitors, pumps, and recorders. Now, <clears throat> moving forward, Baker will continue to contract with SCP controls on an annual basis to review the operating and efficiency conditions of the air scrubbers. And this annual, annual review, review will be performed every spring before our warmer weather gets here. We'll perform airflow tests with trained employees by SCP, and this will allow us to determine the efficiency and conditions of the air ducts, the scrubber fans uh, for any timely repairs or replacements that may need to be made. We'll continue to perform weekly internal and external inspections of the air scrubbers for scheduled repairs and maintenance. And we'll continue to uh, perform preventative maintenance programs for all our odor abatement equipment and rendering equipment. Now what we will do as well um, from some recommendations and information provided to us and conversations with SCP and the DEC is to uh, be begin review and work on, on process diagram of the plant showing major processes, truck holding, unloading, and loading operations, 
odor control systems, and wastewater treatment systems. Now the diagram will also identify the building in which these process systems are located and identify the odor control systems. This will begin to help us to provide perhaps more of a HACCP controlled safety system um, and control system for the, the air scrubber equipment. We'll continue with uh, effective record keeping with the new equipment available to us once we get it, do get it uh, purchased, arrived and installed and we expect to have that sometime in, in February. And uh, we'll also continue to work with the neighbors, with the town board of Penfield and with the DEC to help us reduce uh, these odor control events. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, next uh, is uh, the director, uh, Paul J. D'Amato, uh, Region 8 Director, uh, DEC, for, uh, for his comments. Thank you, Supervisor LaFountain, and uh, thank you for arranging this meeting and inviting uh, us to participate. Um, regarding the compliance and, and violation situation, I know there's been some question about, you know, why DEC didn't do more formal enforcement earlier on. Um, my, in a, in a case like this, my first question to my staff is, do we think that the company is trying to find a solution or do we think we're just getting lip service or BS? And uh, our, my staff was convinced uh, that the company was trying to work in good faith toward uh, improving the odor control situation out there. And under those circumstances, we do give a little more rope uh, before we, we start any type of formal enforcement. I don't want to turn this into a speech about our enforcement uh, uh, program or, or, or nuisance uh, litigation, um, but odor nuisance cases are a little different uh, and they are a little tricky. Um, odors, as we all know, can, can be sporadic. They come and go. Um, receptors can be more or less sensitive. Um, we actually have an engineer that works for us that we won't even send out uh, to, to look at an odor complaint situation because he's a great engineer, but this guy can't smell anything. You, you, you can send him to any situation and he won't smell it. Uh, a lot with respect to odors and when odors are problematic um, really is in the nose of the, of, of the beholder. Um, and in this particular case, the, the regulation that we're talking about here the legal threshold is to prove that there's been an unreasonable interference with, with life or, or comfortable enjoyment of property. Um, it's, it's not an exacting standard, and what it does is it really places the burden on the citizens being affected by odors, uh, being the, the witnesses and the people that have to make the case. Um, with, with an odor nuisance case, it's very, very difficult for us to make that case just with DEC employees because with the standard being an interference um, with with your uh, life or property essentially it falls to the people impacted to to commit a great deal of time um, to a case like that uh, interviews with the prosecuting attorneys possibly being the witnesses etc so while that's not a determining factor uh, preventing us from going forward we do if we think that we can skin the cat some other way. Uh, we'd rather not impose that burden um, on, on, the, on the public to have to carry that ball. Um, there's really no hard number or standard for odors. Uh, there's not a number in, in the permit that you can say, well, they exceeded that number, so it's a clear violation. Um, odors are uh, a, little, a little tricky. However, with all of that said, we have never um, uh, said we would not pursue an enforcement action. Um, we're, we're optimistic based on where we are right now, but should the situation um, deteriorate significantly enough in the future that we think that's warranted, we, we will go forward with it. Um, we, really, we really felt it was preferable that the company spend its time and money trying to find a resolution, and it was preferable in my mind for my staff to spend its time uh, and effort trying to work with the company and with the town to, to find a, uh, you know, an effective set of changes uh, short of spending uh, months or years in litigation. 
And really, had we brought a legal action, a lot of the relief that we would have sought, with, with the exception of a penalty, there probably would have, if we were successful, let's not forget that uh, a defendant does have the right to defend itself. But assuming we were successful, um, there probably a, a normal legal action would carry a monetary fine. But in addition to that, what we seek in all of our enforcement actions is ensuring a return uh, to a compliant situation. So things that we would have sought had we gone the litigation route are many of the things that we have achieved uh, with uh, the help of the town and, and with the cooperation of the company. Things like going out and, and getting a third party consultant, uh, ordering more monitoring equipment to accurately know what's going on in your plant, the types of, of improvements um, that that Baker just talked about here are are the types of things we would have sought and um, we were able to get there uh, without the time uh, expense and the resources of of not only the DEC but certainly any of you that would have would have uh, needed to be a witness to help us um, prevail so instead we you know we upped the number of inspections we we tried to have ourselves be present more we we participated and and, and shadowed the consultant in September, um, all with the hopes of getting a, a, a more effective resolution uh, quicker than we could have gotten through litigation. Now, I will say I'm not ready to do a victory lap uh, based on only two months of, of, uh, of, of, of improved performance, um, but I think we do have reason to be somewhat optimistic that uh, a corner has been turned here. Um, I know some folks have said, well, you know, they, they made these changes after the warmest months of the year, so it's probably just a matter of weather, but um, we're not convinced of that because, uh, you know, we certainly had some nice weather between September 15th uh, and today, and we also, uh, in looking at the log that the town, the complaint log that the town has um, maintained we had complaints last january and february and march which as we all know was some of the most brutal uh winter weather we've had around here in a long time so um you know we're optimistic that that the improvements are not simply the matter of the calendar but that the the changes that have been made by the company will continue to to bear fruit going forward um so our commitment going forward uh, to all of you and, and, and to the town um, is, is this. We, we plan, um, and, and Mr. Schmieder and I did not uh, rehearse this prior to the meeting, um, but we, we do plan to require that uh, revisit by the consultant on a regular basis. Um, and again, as, as he said and as, as we would expect, it will take place before the warm weather uh, in 2015. Uh, my staff will accompany that consultant on all inspections. Um, the consultant will be expected to prepare a report, much like happened this September, with any recommendations, any findings that are made during the inspection. Um, the equipment that Mr. Schmieder just described, the monitoring equipment, uh, the pumps, the uh, recorders, that will all be required to be, uh, to be maintained and the records that are generated from that recording equipment will also be required to be maintained with periodic reports um, to the DEC. All of these commitments um, will be reduced to a new set of permit conditions and their current DEC permit will be modified to include those, those obligations so that um, in the unlikely event that the company uh, chooses uh, not to uh, do what it has committed to do, those will be permit conditions that will then be independently enforceable uh, by DEC. Um, We'll also keep an eye on the odor complaint uh, log and situation. The town's been good enough to, to be the sort of the keeper of the, of the log, but certainly my staff will periodically uh, make an inquiry and, and, and just kind of keep an eye on how things are going as well as uh, at least until we can do that victory lap, um, we'll have uh, more frequent inspections of, of the facility uh, than, than we had in the past. 
Um, again, I'll just close by saying we, we are optimistic that a significant corner has been turned here. Um, we're not going away. We'll, we will be around uh, just in case, um, but we're very hopeful that the measures that, that the companies described and that we will uh, require uh, in, a, in a modified permit will, uh, will do the trick for us going forward. Thank you. Our next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Byron, Dr. Byron S. Uh, Kennedy. Uh, Dr. Kennedy is the, uh, the health director for the county of uh, Monroe. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you, Supervisor LaFountain. Um, we were originally contacted, you know, back, you know, in early September, you know, with regards to this issue. And the main question that was posed to us, you know, was um, rendering, if you will, an assessment of the potential health impacts, you know, of this rendering um, facility. And so at the time that we were um, contacted, you know, our initial response was we're going to need some time to sort of do some of our homework. And that's not unlike, you know, other types of environmental um, concerns that come to our attention. You know, as an, and as an example and as an analogy, you know, sometimes, you know, folks who will come out and they have concerns about a particular manufacturing plant that they may have been around. And as a result of that concern, you know, we will then do some of our homework. And that homework, you know, can include you know, looking at the particular property to sort of see what the history was, if there were any types of um, health impacts associated with that property. We also, you know, um, want to try to assess what the background um, rates may be of a particular condition that is of concern to the community. Oftentimes, you know, that may be a particular type of a cancer, as an example. So we look at that, and then we also try to sort, sort out that background information from what may be concerned in that particular location of the facility. A lot of times we will also work with other agencies, including New York State Department of Health, primarily because, you know, as a large agency at the state level, they have a lot more expertise and a lot more experiences about things that we may have less experience with at the local level. And so certainly in this particular case, that was some of our initial steps, you know, that we started with. And that's part of the reason why it took us a little bit of time. So initially, we wanted to look at some of our old files. You know, it turns out, you know, we have some files that date back to the 1980s. And we needed to gather those and sort of review those. Next, we wanted to reach out, you know, to our sister agency, New York State Department of Health, you know, in Albany. And we wanted to sort of actually understand, you know, what information they had. It turns out they had done, you know, an extensive, you know, analysis about what the potential health impacts um, were or could be associated with such a facility back in the 1990s. And so we reviewed that information. They concluded at the time that there were no associated long-term chronic conditions associated with such a facility, although it did acknowledge that, you know, you can have, you know, temporary um, acute um, health impacts, which could include anything that ranged from nausea to having an odor to having headaches. Some folks you know, actually having, if you will, you know, some irritation, irritation in the eyes, irritation perhaps in the lungs. But that being said, all of the data, I guess maybe to date, you know, suggested that there were no long-term chronic effects, uh, health effects associated with that. And so as we reached back out to them in this context with um, the recent issues going on here, um, we asked them to update that literature search and get more updated information about um, what had changed between that information back that they did in the 1990s up to the present time. And they did that. And their more recent um, assessment, you know, concluded that there was nothing had changed you know, um, in terms of the long-term health impacts based upon what they had identified back in the 1990s between then and now. We also reached out, you know, to um, our colleagues in New York State um, Department of DEC. And with that, I guess, you know, reach out, really getting an idea of what had happened with regards to operations, you know, over time, but also with regards to um, compliance, you know, with existing um, federal and state laws and regulations. And based upon um, that um, homework, you know, we heard from them that there had been no instances where they were out of compliance. You know, and so as we had them, as we had those different agencies doing respective homework, we then ended up convening a call, if you will, where we had the different players, you know, ourselves, you know, state DOH and state DEC um, come together to sort of share that information. Another thing that we did was really look at the New York State Department of Labor. You know, one of the reasons for doing that was because if there's a concern of any type of environmental exposure that could relate to any health effects, presumably folks who work in that setting have higher exposures or more direct contact 
And so as oftentimes is the case with environmental um, conditions that are associated with chronic diseases, a lot of times a nice convenient way of studying that is looking at folks who are occupationally exposed because those folks have higher exposures over longer periods of time. And so the thought was, you know, if there were any types of um, chronic effects, then may, perhaps we might see um, some certain complaints, whether those are health-related complaints or other complaints that came in from folks who worked at that facility. And based upon the information that we got from your State Department of Labor, there were no such complaints associated with health impacts um, given that environment. You know, and so based upon the information from New York State Department of Health, New York State Department of DEC, and also New York State Department of Labor, which includes, you know, some of the OSHA requirements, you know, that cover um, employees, um, none of that actually maybe suggested that you actually had any um, types of long-term chronic um, health effects. You know, and so based upon um, that information, um, we feel that it's reasonable because maybe um, to uh, conclude that there are no long-term chronic conditions associated with that. That being said, you certainly have some of the acute, um, more temporary types of um, health impacts that I mentioned already, including some of the irritation, including some of the odors. A few comments about odors in and of themselves. The intensity of an odor does not necessarily represent, you know, um, health impacts. You can actually have a very intense odors that have no, I guess, health impacts, and you can also have uh, uh, things that don't give odors at all that have very serious impacts. So just a couple of examples. You know, so in the case of things that may be very pungent odor-wise, um, one example is a lot of times, you know, folks, if they're next to or they're living near um, farming on property, you know, the odors associated with some of the farming or whether that's the manure from cows and the like, you know, can oftentimes be very bothersome to the local residents or folks who are uh, in that vicinity. Another example may be um, a particular restaurant, you know, that as a process of how they prepare their food or how they cook it, um, while a very different type of odor, let's say, from what you might get from cows, it could still nevertheless, you know, be bothersome to residents who are smelling that. And yet again, in that situation, there's not necessarily any health impacts, you know, long-term associated. On the other um, spectrum, we can have things that are completely odorless, and such as carbon monoxide, which can actually be deadly. We can actually have, you know, other things, you know, as well, whether that's a food outbreak, where someone may have consumed some food that's contaminated with a microorganism, and oftentimes, you know, with that microorganism, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but it can lead to very serious um, health impacts that can render somebody going into the hospital. So those examples, you know, just you know, help um, highlight the fact that the intensity of an odor does not necessarily represent its um, health impact, whether it's acutely or whether that's long term. So coming back maybe to the present issue, um, again, based upon our very extensive discussions and some of our own homework and also the homework of our sister agencies, our position from Monroe County Department of Public Health is that there are no long-term chronic um, health effects um, based upon the information that we have at this time. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Um, thank you uh, to um, all the representatives uh, from the different agencies. Now, the, uh, the main reason why uh, the, we came together tonight uh, was at the request of uh, many of you uh, with specific uh, questions that you may have. Uh, we have all of the um, uh, agencies here uh, involved uh, with this uh, and available to, uh, to answer any questions. I do have three sign-ups. I'll start with that. Uh, once I've gone through those sign-ups, then I'll open it up. Again, we'll do first-time speakers, and then uh, if uh, anyone has any follow-up uh, questions, they certainly uh, then uh, can have second, third, uh, or as uh, long as we need. Um, the first, uh, the first person that I have is uh, Rob Quinn on our town board. Good evening, everyone. I'm Councilman Rob Quinn. And I would like to thank Supervisor LaFountain for coordinating this meeting on behalf of the town residents and town board. As you are aware, the town board received a petition in mid-July from more than 130 residents regarding the operations and odor emissions of Baker Commodities. Since then, this town board, I believe, has been proactive in trying to resolve the problem. I, for one, have been urging an open dialogue between the town, Baker Commodities, and DEC officials and our state representatives as well, 
since this board received DEC's response in midsummer, a response that I believe lacked substance, answers, and most disheartening, any real interest by DEC in determining the validity of our residents' concerns. I cannot speak for my fellow board members, but I can tell you that I was, and I still am, disappointed and frustrated. While I understand that rendering plants are not as prevalent in New York State as protected wetlands or as common as applications that require DEC input, DEC is nevertheless the permitting agency and has the responsibility to assure municipalities and residents that rendering plants are operating in compliance with its permit. So the primary reason I am frustrated is that I do not believe this town board or these residents have received an adequate response to our concerns. I have been on the town board for almost five years, and I have seen the attention to detail which DEC requires this board or residents or developers on an even the most routine of applications. I know the due diligence by which DEC conducts its reviews and issues its reports. And DEC should be attentive and exercise due diligence. They are the state agency charged with protecting our environment and air and water quality. So how could I not be disappointed and frustrated when it looks like the DEC was neither attentive nor diligent in responding to our concerns regarding the rendering operations at Baker Commodities? The town, board, the town board's letter to DEC dated July 24th asked four questions. First, is Baker Commodities fully compliant with its current New York State Department of Environmental Conservation permit? Second, if not, what specific corrective measures are needed to obtain compliance? Third, have violations occurred, and if so, what enforcement measures or sanctions will be or have been taken? And fourth, do the subject noxious odors or chemicals emitted by Baker Commodities present a danger to public health? DEC's response back to the town was dated August 6th. So the first question I have for DEC tonight, in the two weeks between our inquiry and your response, what was the process to determine that Baker Commodities was in compliance with its permit? Our staff conducted regular inspections of Baker throughout this problem. Uh, not only in 2014, but occasionally earlier than that. Um, the, we need to remember that saying someone is in violation of their permit is the legal conclusion. And that can only be done either on admission of a defendant or after a due process or a trial or whatever your, your enforcement mechanism can be. So there was no conclusion that they violated a permit. Um, and uh, we were consistently <laughs> involved with them throughout the summer in terms of inspections, uh, the review, and uh, ultimately the dialogue which led to what we are hoping to be um, long-term solutions to the problem. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Um, that was our approach through the summer. Well, the response that we received on August 6th was uh, pretty vague in its definitive uh, processes that were involved in determining whether or not Baker was in compliance with its permit. So as I just mentioned, that was frustrating from my perspective, and I wanted to have a little bit more of sort of an in-depth analysis or, or study or some form of report uh, I think would have definitely have helped alleviate some of my concerns as well as some of my neighbors' concerns. And I think the, the quick turnaround from our inquiry to the response was also a little, a little surprising in the fact that, as I mentioned, DEC is not one to just overlook the smallest of details. So for an well, ongoing you. study, for an ongoing <laughs> study over a number of years or at least over the number of more, more recent months, uh, again, a two-week turnaround was, was pretty shocking and I think disappointing from my perspective. I'm sorry for being so quick to respond. Um, the 
I will say that should you, I was not aware of your personal frustration over this issue, you're always welcome to call my office if you experience that level of frustration in the future. In terms of uh, a long-term study to evaluate compliance with the permit, um, the permit conditions read as they read and our staff, I'm very confident in our staff to be able to assess that compliance. So, um, and you do need to understand that uh, your inquiry, the town's inquiry, uh, was not our first involvement with the situation this year. So that was already a work in progress when the letter hit my desk, but we answered it as best we could, and I'm, I'm sorry if you were not completely satisfied with our response. Okay, thank you. Second, we are aware that Baker Commodities hired an outside vendor, mm -hmm. SPC Controls, to inspect the equipment at the plant. And after reviewing the findings, is DEC satisfied that the inspection was truly independent, or do you think that DEC should require a second inspection by a DEC-selected DEC vendor to verify the initial findings or determine if other corrective measures are needed? Um, I will speak for myself. I'm, I'm here tonight with our regional air pollution control engineer, Tom Marriott, who, if he feels like he wants to add anything to what I say is more than welcome to, but um, my sense of it was that this was a very qualified consultant based on their resume and their work around the country, and um, at this juncture, I'm prepared to accept that report uh, primarily because the uh, odor situation has gotten better since September. Um, and we are at this point taking very much a wait and see approach. Should a significant problem recur, all those avenues are open to us, including um, insisting upon or, or pursuing Baker to uh, bring in other consultants potentially. Um, I don't see the burning need for that at this point. Um, you know, this is a reputable consultant. Uh, who does a lot of work in this industry, and uh, that's what you're looking for when you ask somebody to bring in consulting expertise. Third, your response dated August 6th mentions nuisance odors on several occasions, yet fails to explain what a nuisance odor is. In fact, the letter states, you should be aware that being compliant with its permit does not always prevent nuisance odors or nuisance conditions from occurring. So I ask, at what point does a nuisance odor become more than a nuisance and become a violation, an operational failure on the part of the plant to contain odor emissions or maintain quality of life for neighbors? I am sure there are many residents here tonight who would agree or argue that the frequency or pungency of odors have reached this critical point already and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with them. So in other words, what would trigger a DEC investigation or prompt DEC to modify, suspend, or revoke Baker Commodities permit? Is there an objective qualifier, some quantitative data, or high-level testing reviewed by DEC? That is one of the difficulties when you're talking about odors and nuisance. As I tried to explain in, in my comments, it's not as simple as being able to count a number of violations and saying that's over the line, let's pull their permit. It's very much a case specific evaluation. Um, you know, our evaluation of, of this particular case was that the time and effort was better spent to try to uh, convince the company to stay at seeking a resolution than to try to make uh, a referral to the Attorney General for a legal assessment as to whether there was or was not a public nuisance. Um, that was the path forward that we chose. Um, reasonable people can disagree, I guess, as to whether that was the right one, but we're hoping that um, the recent performance and performance going forward will bear us out. Okay. And finally, I would like to thank Dr. Kennedy for being here tonight, but I do have a question or two regarding DEC's role and obligations regarding odor emissions and public health. The town board asked in its letter if the noxious odors or chemicals emitted by Baker Commodities present a danger to public health. And as quickly as DEC stated in its letter of August 6th that no violations of the permit had occurred, 
DEC follows up by stating that the town board will need to consult with the Monroe County Health Department regarding health questions, continuing staff does not have the expertise, DEC staff. When it comes to Baker Commodities and the fact that this has been an ongoing issue for years, I am disappointed that DEC punted this important question back to the town board to follow up with the county health department. Under condition four of Baker Commodities permit, item 4.1, there's a list of allowable contaminant, contaminants during planning missions, all of which I am sure are defined or quantified somewhere in state or federal statute, no, yet no reference to this condition or these contaminants were mentioned in the DEC response of August 6th. So my obvious question is this. How can DEC determine if Baker's commodities, Baker Commodities is fully compliant with its permit without first determining whether any health risks may exist due to odor or chemical emissions from the plant? Wouldn't your office have a direct conversation or two or three or more with Dr. Kennedy's office first to rule out definitively that any health risks may exist? And why wouldn't DEC help facilitate any necessary and all neighborhood studies that needed to be done? I'm sorry, was that for me or for uh, it Dr. Is, it Kennedy? It is for the DEC, yes. Well, the DEC routinely refers questions about health to the, either the local health department or the state health department. Um, even if you assumed that there might be a health issue, uh, an assumption I don't think we're making. Mm -hmm. But if you did, that could very well be a distinct issue from whether somebody's complying with their permit or not. Not every problem created is necessarily directly related to a permit condition that is written. It does not mean, however, that it's not an actionable problem. It just means that it may be a violation of something else or an actionable um, uh, case that is not based on the violation of a specific condition. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense, but <laughs> so well, so what, so typically when when we do get a question of is what these guys are doing over here whether or not compliant with your permit, if someone has a concern about it being a health impact, we we routinely refer to the experts on health. Yeah, I, I bring this, this question up because as I was reading your response on August 6th, it, again, it was a, a two-page response to a letter that we submitted. And again, my frustration was the permit is about 34, 35 pages long. And it's pretty in-depth of what is, is covered within the permit. So when I receive a two-page response that has three or four paragraphs just sort of answering, or I would say, dismissing sort of some of our concerns, valid concerns that we submitted to DEC on behalf of the residents. Again, that's why I was sort of disappointed and, and frustrated with receiving the responses because two sentences after it was mentioned, the way I'm reading it, my perception is two sentences after I see there's no violation, I see we don't have the expertise or in-house staff to determine whether there are any health risks. So my obvious question was there's no violation Oh, but wait a minute, they don't really know if there are any health risks. So in reading the response that we received on August 6th, you can understand where my frustration was. And then when we have residents coming to town board meetings for the next two to three to four months asking what we think of the DEC response, and my answer is, I don't know what to make, with, what to make of it any, any more than what you do. That's why I'm here asking these questions tonight. So. So again, I wanna thank you all for being in attendance. I know that my questions this evening were directed toward DEC, but the operating permit that Baker Commodities must comply with is issued and overseen by DEC. So I believe that the DEC must present a better case than its August 6th letter to satisfy my concerns and those of my neighbors that there are no problems at the plant. As the permitting agency, I believe the burden of proof falls on the DEC. Perhaps after tonight's comments, DEC will take a more in-depth look into the permit and Baker Commodities operations, as this board requested originally in July. Perhaps a more in-depth look would determine that a second independent study of the plant should be done. Perhaps a second study would lead to a more open dialogue between DEC and the County Health Department regarding noxious odors and chemical emissions. 
Perhaps then DEC would review Baker Commodities permit, which is almost 16 years old, and exercise its power as the regulatory agency to modify the permit as needed to ensure that the plant can be good, a good neighbor and that assures our residents that their concerns are not being overlooked or ignored. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. The next uh, person that uh, signed up is uh, Bob Reed, 275 Parkview Drive. Evening, Bob. Evening, Tony. Thanks for coming tonight. It's good to see you all here. I had some prepared remarks. <clears throat> I am Bob Reed, 275 Parkview Drive for the last 28 years. I am, in a way, just a citizen, but I'm also uh, uh, a member of an ad hoc uh, group of neighbors who've labored on this particular outbreak for nine years to try to bring <clears throat> something like this uh, together tonight, uh, recognition and resolution because this, this recent outbreak has been of nine years duration. It began in the spring of 2005. Rather suddenly, the previous eight years, we had no reported odor complaints. That's a huge fact. And I have to tell you that we were ready to jump on Baker commodities in 1997, 98, and 99 because 96 had been such a horrific year. We were ready to jump down their throats. There was nothing to jump on. We practically forgot they were there. <clears throat> and after eight years of near perfection, something big changed in 2005. So I, I, um, I am part of a group that's worked on this. And uh, I have some prepared remarks, but I wanted to just begin <clears throat> quickly by asking Dr. Kennedy, and I don't mean to grab you by the lapels, but do you have some idea, doctor, of how many chemicals are in rendering plant emissions? Just a ballpark idea. And, and I, I would think maybe you'd say no, but we had a specialist from uh, Ashland Technologies here last year who had no idea. He was there here to help Baker Commodities with the odors, and he had no idea what chemicals were causing the odors. Um, I'm not sure I expect you would know that answer, but have you run into that number anywhere? No, I have not. Okay. Well, we did some looking around, and the first number we found <clears throat> was that there are roughly 26 chemicals that cause foul odors. Um, but the total number of chemicals appears to be about 110. And I have an article, I finally was able to get my hand on it, uh, thanks to the intercession of some, uh, some folks here tonight. And it's very troubling. I'm not going to read them all. I probably can't pronounce half of them. But on the list is butane benzene, toluene, octane, butyl benzene isomer, dimethyl trisulfide, and I won't go on, but 110. That's a troubling number uh, to think that all those chemicals can be jumbled up together into a kind of a cocktail and sprayed with sodium hypochlorite or chlorine dioxide and then introduced to our lungs or the lungs of our children. Now, I don't know that all of them are. We don't know what comes into our neighborhood. We don't know for sure what's coming out of the stacks at Baker Commodities. But one of the things that we really feel is necessary is some real testing. And not just, we don't know if there are any health effects. We haven't seen any. And I'm not sure that the, the, the consideration of rendering plant employees is, is such a great way to measure uh, uh, whether there are health effects. Um, I suspect, Bill could correct me if I'm wrong, that there's considerable turnover in the, fact, in the workers in the factory. Bill's been there for many years. Um, the workers are not actually breathing what comes out of the stacks. And they're not breathing what we breathe in the neighborhood. Air is introduced to the plant, negative pressure, and drawn up through the, through the, uh, the scrubbers. So we think the testing is necessary. And it's not just good enough to say, that we can't really see any problems. Um, <clears throat> now, um, <coughs> excuse me. So let me just go back to the beginning and, uh, and uh, introduce some of my prepared remarks. And Tony, I'd like to say that your numbers and my numbers differ on the number of voters. Uh, we have almost 190 
for the year, 190 reports from individuals. Last year there were 80, so this year is more than double last year, and, and last year more than double the year before. So we can see the last three years a serious degradation in Baker's ability to control odors that seemed to correspond to their attempt, as Bill was describing, to fix the problem. But the odors got worse and worse. Uh, we're concerned with the benchmark of 97 to 2004, when we had zero odors. Okay. We think they can do that. Okay. So it's encouraging tonight to see all the stakeholders gathered, but depressing too since it's taken nine years, two score of meetings, hundreds of complaints, and a neighborhood petition drive, um, and perhaps most importantly and unfortunately, negative media coverage of our neighborhood and of our town. Um, secondly, it's a bit depressing because the neighbors, the neighborhood committee that's worked so long on this has been excluded from the meetings that have taken place in the last four months. We did ask Tony to include us in meetings with the DEC and the plant. Many of us asked him that, and he, he didn't come out and decline, but he did not invite us to those meetings. Previously, we had been part of a stakeholders group that met with the plant and the DEC, but we were not allowed to be part of this. So all we have is rather woefully and incomplete information from the DEC and the plant and the odor consultant, SCP. This is the opposite of transparency in government. It makes the residents with serious problems feel as if they're the problem, not the odors from Baker. But here's the situation. For 60 days now, after a run of 190 complaints in, in this year, we have <coughs> had roughly 60 odor-free days. We did have a report of odors last Friday for a few hours, and we got a report from Bill today uh, that uh, apparently was related to a mechanical malfunction in the thermal oxidizer. We're hoping we've turned a corner, as Mr. D'Amato said. We're not ready to do a victory lap. Uh, we hope it's a cure. We're afraid it's a remission. We're afraid that uh, we're getting a treat, but then it's going to be a trick later on. Because, as I say, this is the fourth cycle of serious odors that our neighborhood has endured. 85 to 88, 92 to 93, the summer of 96 that some of us will never forget, <coughs> and 2005 to September 15th. Because it all ended September 15th, pretty much. The day that SCP arrived at the plant, the odors stopped. There were two very early morning odor complaints, um, and Bill remarked that the plant wasn't even operating. But there were two very early odor complaints, and there, was, there has not been, there has been only one since. So since BC, uh, Baker has eliminated the odors for eight years flawlessly, 97 to 05. It seems clear to us that they could have turned off the odors at almost any time in the last nine years. So why did it take so long? And to be honest with you, I hold Baker Commodities the least culpable of all the stakeholders. BC follows its corporate DNA, increase volume, lower costs, increase profits. Odor control can only be a drag on profits. They have to look at that constantly and they have to try to control that number. And we feel <clears throat> that they have almost certainly tried to economize on odor control in the last nine years. So who's more culpable than, DC, than Baker Commodities? The people charged with protecting the residents, the board and the DEC. They protected Baker by ignoring our complaints and calls for very specific actions. Tony, <coughs> excuse me, unilaterally disbanded the last stakeholders group in 2013, declared the town would take no action. The residents in frustration fashioned a seven point petition. It took us about a month and a half of dickering with each other and about three months to carry it around the neighborhood and get the 134, 135 signatures that we have to back it up. Virtually everyone in the neighborhood we approached signed. And then came media attention that no one likes, um, especially the town. And suddenly we saw that the board changed its attitude. 
after years of ignoring our complaints and f uh, refusing to take any action whatsoever, even to gather more information, the board <coughs> started to demand a solution of the DEC. <coughs> it did so in spite of our caution that the DEC, in our opinion, helped to insulate and protect Baker for nine years through inadequate inspections. And what was truly needed was our petition point number three, the engagement of a qualified, neutral, and independent odor consultant to thoroughly evaluate the BC odor issue. The town would have none of it, and apparently the DEC too. Uh, we already knew the plant manager, Bill, would not willingly allow uh, an, an outsider to evaluate his plant. The residents were denied participation in this new stakeholder group. The DEC very soon declared Baker in conformance with its permit without, as far as we know, any evidence of emissions testing or consideration of the degradation of quality of life, both uh, permit conditions. And in my opinion, it gave BC a very great gift. Uh, it said, hire your own consultant. <coughs> and in a flash, even before we even knew this was going to be required, BC retained SCP controls, I believe, in Minnesota a consultant that has worked for them on several other occasions. <coughs> they issued a curt four-page report that was only a partial look at the problem and offered no important conclusions. That's my opinion. Uh, four pages. The 1997 uh, SCP report was 18 pages long. It was very thorough. This report only looked at the scrubbers. It didn't look at how they handle their materials. It didn't look how, at how they handle the trucks, how they're cleaned and deodorized. It didn't look at uh, how adequately the building is sealed so that a negative pressure can be created. And most importantly, it didn't look at the thermal oxidizers, the big gun of odor control. So it seemed to be an extremely narrow look at the problem. And as they say, magically, the odors vanished the day that SCP arrived before they could evaluate, make recommendations, and issue a report or get those recommendations implemented. <coughs> and what's more, we have no idea why it's been nine years, why this has been going on for the full nine years. So I guess the big issue is what's next? In past cases, once the odors were gone, that has been the end of it. No penalties, no sanctions, no increased monitoring. Just back to business as usual. And eventually, back to awful odors. And this has to be seen as a win-win for Baker. I mean, what possible motivation could it be for Baker to stay on top of odors if they're never punished in any way, no matter how outrageous the outbreak of odors? And the best example of that would be 1996, when they had a series of breakdowns at the plant, and they were stuck over a period of weeks with over 300,000 pounds of decaying material that they could not process or keep in an odor abated area. And that's not my number. Now, that number came from the Monroe County Department of Health, and I think it must have come from Baker Commodities itself. 300, over 300,000 pounds of animal carcasses, uh, fats, oils, and greases. Eventually, most of it got exported evacuated, but it was weeks of horrific odors for us. Baker fixed it, as I said. Eventually, they fixed it, and they fixed it masterfully. We had no odors for eight years. But Baker never paid a fine for that. Uh, I, 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 somebody could tell me they have, but as far as we can tell, nothing ever happened. Nothing's ever happened after any of these odor outbreaks. And I think, really, in, in the real world, there have to be penalties, serious penalties. And that's something we called for in our petition. Serious penalties, not a slap on the wrist. At board meetings I've attended, the town has either ignored or refused to undertake other important actions to keep this cycle from reemerging. The penalty issue. Okay. The chemical issue. Should we be in the dark about the chemicals we may have to breathe even when the odors are gone? Many of the 110 don't smell, okay? I've asked this question of the board on two, at two different board meetings. I've said, would you like your children to be breathing this stuff and not know what it is? And I've never gotten an answer from the board. 
I think I know the answer in their hearts, but they've never articulated it. Of course, none of us want our kids or any of us to have to breathe this stuff. We want to know what is in our air. But if they say, Bob, we're with you, we know there has to be testing, then they've got to get it done. And there hasn't been a willingness that I've seen yet to either pay to get it done <coughs> or to find some way to get a third party to do it, a un local university or the DEC or the State Department of Health or whatever. Clearly, some of the things we've asked for, the town board can't do itself, but they can they can use the bully pulpit here. They can stand up for us and see that other people get these things done and that these important things get done. A third thing, <coughs> should the, uh, Mr. Quinn talked about the state, the DEC enforcing its permit. Should the town look the other way at Baker's non-conforming use permit? That's a town permit. That's a permit <coughs> that Baker acquired when they bought the company from the Stappenbeck Rendering Company that went bankrupt around 1980. Uh, they'd not, they would not be allowed to start a rendering plant today in that location, but they got a non-conforming use permit because rendering had been going on there since uh, uh, for over 100 years. But there's a restriction on it. They're not supposed to exceed the size and scope of the previous operation. Now, this is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Baker Shirley has exceeded the size and scope of the Stappenbeck Company. Bill Stappenbeck couldn't even feed his family with that antiquated operation uh, and what he was processing. It was a local operation. Since Baker purchased <coughs> this plant, we believe they've purchased and closed the other rendering plants in New York State and shipped the materials here from the west and from the east. We don't know the full dimensions of their feeder area. <coughs> I'm not sure this is a bad thing. I think it's a great service to the state of New York, and I think the DEC's got to be concerned that this service continue to be rendered. Sorry for the pun. Um, these materials should not be landfilled. They should be reprocessed. I give them a lot of credit for doing it and making money at it. Um, but this permit needs to be trotted out by the town, the town zoning board, examined and reissued they need to be allowed to continue legally, but there need to be protections in place to say that increased volume does not mean increased odors. And as we have said from the beginning, we're not trying to shut Baker commodities down, but we want this out in the open. We also, according to uh, our petition, we would like the uh, confidentiality agreement between the town of Penfield and Baker commodities to be opened and released to the public. We don't think it's right that a town that has regulatory power over a company has a private agreement with the company that is a secret from the residents. We are Penfield. <coughs> Supervisor Don Mack referred to it as a secret agreement in 1989 um, and then very quickly withdrew that statement, said, no, we don't have a secret agreement with them. But we've come into uh, uh, possession of a document that refers to the confidentiality agreement and, and the, the unhappiness of the town's outside counsel in having to comply with it and return subpoenaed evidence to Baker Commodities at the end of the lawsuit in 89. That needs to be put on the table <coughs> and, and the air cleared. <coughs> we need, as others have said, and maybe, maybe Mr. D'Amato has indicated is already happening, increased monitoring and compliance of the plant. Mr. Marriott, uh, the, the engineer for the DEC that I've worked with uh, for many, many years on and off, explained to me several years ago, Bob, we visit the plant once a year for two hours. We walk through the plant. It's not really operating at full capacity. It's not really rendering. We walk through the plant, and then we spend the rest of the time with paperwork. And he said, Bob, I'm not going to be there when they make the odors, which is typically between 10 p.m. and about 3 a.m., although the production cycle I know varies from time to time. That's not real monitoring or compliance. Um, uh, DEC engineer Bonarski did a walkthrough of the plant, I believe, after Tony's letters to the DEC. <coughs> that was not real monitoring. 
Uh, we need serious monitoring. Somebody needs to be there on a, a surprise basis in the middle of the night when they're processing and looking at all the dials and all the bells and whistles, and maybe driving through the neighborhood at 3 a.m. We've had a, quite a large number of complaints from people who, for one reason or another, leave or enter the neighborhood at 2, 3, or 4 a.m. It happened to me when I had to take my wife to the emergency room at 3 a.m. We went out, uh, we went out, and it stank like the old days. It stank worse than I'd smelled in many years. It stank like in the 80s when there was very little odor control. Um, it happened this last year when uh, a, a young neighbor returned to the house about 2 a.m. <coughs> so somebody needs to actually be there when the odors are manufactured. We very often get the odors after the plant is in a shutdown mode, okay? They may finish at 5 a.m. And we wake up at 7, the air is beginning to move, the air is beginning to warm, and it rises. And uh, if you know the topography of the area, they're in the Irondequoit Creek Valley, and we get the odor. It follows the valley uh, northward and then gets the west winds and blows onto Old Westfall Drive. There needs to be real monitoring. Uh, there needs to be real response from the town as well as the DEC. I have to say that when Tony responds to odor complaints, Typically, it is a very polite email to Bill Schmieder saying, Bill, anything wrong down there? And <coughs> today was a good example. And Bill came back with an explanation that there was something wrong. But no matter what Bill says, there's something wrong and we fixed it, or there's nothing wrong, everything looks normal, that always appears to be the end of it. I don't think there's ever been any follow-up from the town. Um, I think that's got to change. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to put things in place to make sure that this problem doesn't get ignored if it comes back. Some of these things will help. Up to now, I think Baker has almost been allowed to regulate itself. So much of this has been self-regulation. I know they've been compelled over the years to put in odor control, and it's, for the most part, not as bad as it was in the 80s or 90s. We have made great progress. <coughs> but we want to get from fair to great. We want to get back to great. <coughs> we don't want to have people cancel their dinner parties on their decks because the stink is so bad in the summertime. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm very sorry. Hopefully you're, not, hopefully you're not sick, Bob. No, I'm not. I'm not sick. I'm, I'm in recovery mode. Thank you, Tony. But I didn't get a card from you or from Mr. Horwitz after my surgery. You know, I was very disappointed. It's in the mail. Okay. Um, and to refer to Mr. Horwitz one more time, something I've come to really appreciate, I call it the Horwitz principle. And he used it some years ago uh, after one of my presentations. He said, the proof is in the pudding. <clears throat> We've heard a wonderful presentation from Bill Schmieder and encouraging presentation from Mr. D'Amato, uh, but the proof is in the pudding. We're not going away. Uh, uh, we put too much effort into this, especially this small group of people that has been intensely involved, and other neighbors, too, who've been involved. We're not going away. It's our neighborhood. We have a right to clean air. And we know it's possible. We know it's not impossible. And we hope that uh, this 30-year cycle, it's happened four times, will be over with now. And the things that you put in place mean that when the odors come back, there will be a very quick response, and it won't be this painful, agonized 30-year, uh, a nine-year attempt to get this taken care of. Thank you very much. I think you just one comment, Bob, that <coughs> yes. uh, I feel I need to make, uh, you know, you, I've, I've heard you say a couple times, and I've corrected you, uh, where I've, I un unilaterally uh, stopped uh, those uh, uh, stakeholder meetings, yes. and it was uh, the entire group, uh, with the exception of one person yourself, uh, that agreed to that uh, because we were getting ourselves bogged down in uh, so much detail. We were lo losing the forest through the trees, and uh, everybody that was sitting around the table, with the exception of yourself, uh, agreed that uh, we needed to move on to something different. Uh, so um, I just want to make sure that there's always two sides to every story. Um, and I want to make sure that uh, both both of us have our voice in the room. Sure. Uh, I don't remember it that way at all. I, I, uh, you announced the meetings were going to end, and uh, 
Uh, afterwards, uh, Vern Loveless said, well, it probably was the right thing, Tony, but there was no discussion of it, and I remember nothing from Bill Schmieder on that. In fact, Bill said he was very surprised. Nothing from Tom Marriott on that, nothing from the other residents on that. Uh, I remember it very differently. A unilateral, and, and you did give your word that those meetings would continue until we came to consensus. Mm -hmm. There was no discussion that I recall. There was no, there was no discussion because we were going nowhere. Um, and uh, so uh, my last comment is, is that uh, we didn't, I did not say we would do nothing. Um, you know, so uh, <coughs> I, I, I heard, uh, I heard you say that uh, my comment was we would do nothing, and I, you know, um, I, I did not say that we would do nothing. Uh, what I wrote down in my notes is uh, what you said was, uh, the town of Penfield will take no action. Okay. Does that sound familiar? It, it, it doesn't, uh, Bob. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you for your comments. The next person is uh, Jeff Burns. Uh, Jeff is at 39 Scarborough Park. Hi, thank you. So one of the difficulties with this issue, I think, has been that uh, it's uh, very easy to stay, stay in subjective uh, interpretations of what's going on rather than objective. And uh, I'm hoping that we can concentrate on the objective here. Uh, so first, I, I have this is a question and answer. I have a few questions. Uh, one of my questions would be for, for Bill. Uh, the National Rendering Association uh, estimates that approximately 59 billion pounds of inedible animal byproducts are rendered annually, and there are 205 plants in the U.S. Would you say Baker Commodities is a typical plant? Typical in what? In production, in terms of the amount that it renders. I really don't have those yeah. figures. I don't know. Uh, well, what is the production at, uh, at Baker Commodity? If the average plant uh, produces uh, from by my back of the envelope kind of measure, uh, 288 million pounds are rendered a year. Is that uh, in the ballpark of what happens at Baker? Uh, that, that's confidential information. Okay, so we don't really have an idea then of what the scale of the production is. And is there anything in terms of the town, in terms of the uh, uh, permit that the town has provided that would give any indication of what the scale of production is at Baker or what it could be? I don't, uh, I mean, I don't have uh, what that, uh, what that is, uh, Jeff. So is it theoretically it could be unlimited? Well, I, I would, uh, I would certainly look for some, some thoughts and uh, some comments from some others, but uh, you can only run through that plant uh, what you can run through that plant. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, if the number is, you know, a thousand pounds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you can't right. crank 3,000 yeah. pounds through it uh, type yeah. of thing. So you're, you're limited by, you know the existing equipment uh, that's there, uh -huh. uh, and uh, what it uh, what it can process on a daily basis. Okay. Well, it, the average plant uh, renders 288 million. That's just an average of the 205 plants that the National Rendering Association says that exist uh, in the North America. That's 288 per per year. 288 million pounds uh, per year. Uh, per year, 24 million pounds per month, about uh, or about a million pounds per day if operated five days a week. Uh, and I don't know what your operation is. This was, again, just back of the, back of the envelope, so I, I don't know. And now these you know, it could be a great variety of size of plants. Maybe there are some that are huge, and this is a smaller plant. I don't know that, and, and you, you, you're not telling me that. No, you didn't ask that question. OK, well, is this a big or a there small are, plant? In comparison, it's a small plant. OK. All right. Uh, one of the things that was brought up was uh, about that condition 29, which is one of the conditions of the permit. Um, and there's a few people have brought this up, and uh, I think uh, uh, Rob did a good job of asking some questions on this as well, uh, that uh, this part of the permit says that no person shall cause or allow emissions, and I'm going to skip ahead, uh, to unreasonably interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property, uh, notwithstanding the existence of specific air quality standards or emission limits, this is not limited to any uh, this is not limited to odor. It can be all these other items and stuff. Uh, now, uh, Mr. D'Amato, you had uh, said that uh, you know there are var variations in how people perceive odors. Uh, are noxious odors uh, measurable? 
Well, I think what the point I was trying to make is that different receptors react differently to odors. In fact, when we were dealing with this, I don't know why this sticks in my mind, probably tells you more about me than about the situation, but when we were dealing with this in the 80s, I remember one resident actually complained that people were complaining because he said that their barbecue grills were as offensive to him as the odors from Baker. Now, personally, I wouldn't take that position, uh -huh. um, but it's just a fact that different people react and react at lower thresholds. My wife's nose is much more sensitive than mine is. Right. Um, so the condition that you're referencing, and I don't know that I'm articulate enough to, to explain this without making it more confusing than it is, that's essentially a photocopy of one of our regulations. It, the part 211 is that condition verbatim that our air division made a choice many years ago to include as a permit condition. As a legal matter, it's unnecessary because w if you violate that condition, it really doesn't matter much whether, you're, whether it's in your permit or whether it's an independent violation of our regulation because we can pursue either. But it, it, and I think that's the although I didn't write it, <laughs> I will say that's the reason why it has the language about notwithstanding any other um, air uh, uh, standards um, you have it in front of you. Something like air notwithstanding air specific air quality standards, yeah. because there are other specific air quality standards, and this regulation is designed to make clear that even if you're complying with other standards, you do not have the right to do that right what that language is okay. so um, I've been talking a while and I'm not sure I answered your question the, well, I, the, think I, I, I get what you're the, saying the, the, okay. so okay. so so the 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 uh, not to quote the town attorney but the proof is it in the pudding you, you have to make the case that um, there is an interference what it was that it was unreasonable um, and the only people that can testify to that are the people that are so affected. Right. And, that's, and that's one of the, the difficulties as opposed to, um, say, one of our wastewater permits where you may be allowed or authorized to discharge 50 pounds a day of something. Mm -hmm. Report comes in, if there's 55 pounds, it's a violation. If there's 45 pounds, you're in compliance. Yeah. Odors are much, are, are, are much trickier to try to, because there's not a, that kind of specific standard. So, so to, to make that case, you sort of have to get your group of, of affected people with a lot of detail about how they've been impacted, when, why, what that impact was. Were you chased inside? From a you know from a playing outside with your kids, where yeah. so it it's they're not easy cases, but I but I'm not here to you know whine about how tough it is to prove that case. I mean I, I'm just trying to be um, candid that it's not necessarily a, a an easy slam dunk for someone to say I smelled something today, right. boom, that's a violation of of either our regulation or the yeah. permit. There's now, who, who determines if Baker is in conformance or non-conformance? Is it the DEC or is it when it goes to court and a ruling is made? At what point is it determined whether they are in conformance or well, non-conformance? Well, what, what DEC does is take a position as to whether somebody's in violation or not. There's a couple of, of different avenues. Typically, with the nuisance type of case, it has been referred to the Attorney General's Office for prosecution. They are the state agency litigators. There is an avenue for administrative enforcement, but you're essentially trying to prove the same thing, and then if a defendant uh, wants to, they can then go to court, and so it kind of takes twice as long. Um, so we take the initial position as to whether somebody's in compliance with their permit or not, okay. And in most cases, um, we've been fairly successful at resolving those, you know, by consent, by, by mutual agreement rather than litigation. Yeah. In this case, we didn't bring a case. So, As I say, I'm trying to move toward objective as much as possible. I, I understand. And what would be a point, uh, objectively, at which uh, you would say that they were a nonconformance based on this issue? 
Uh, Mr. Reed has mentioned that there were over 190 complaints, mm -hmm. and he's also mentioned that there's been complaints for nine years. At what threshold does it uh, become uh, something that would be considered uh, a nonconformance? Yeah, I, it's it's difficult to quantify, although I, I respect the effort to get objective rather than yeah. subjective, because that would make life a lot easier for us as well as for, for you. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you really, in our experience, we, we've just tried to make as good of an assessment as we can in terms of numbers of people that are impacted, how frequently, and as I said before, is the company making an effort to resolve it, or do we have to chase them? Um, and, you know, I, I guess, you know, looking back, certainly reasonable minds can say, well, wait, what, wasn't this way over the threshold at those kinds of numbers? Um, we are where we are. I, I, I can, you know, I, I can say what the Attorney General said years ago when, when we pursued the Monaco oil situation, and that is, you know, we can talk about what happened in the past, but we're here now, you know, and, and that's, I think, what we're trying to accomplish is, is making sure that going forward, you know, we're not returning to, before you talk about statutes of limitations and other things, if you want to go back too many years. But um, so I don't know if that answered your question at all. I apologize if yeah. it didn't. Now, have you had any cases uh, where there were odors and you did anything to measure odors? Are, are there ways of measuring odors other than having somebody with a bad nose go in and say, I can't? Yeah, <laughs> well, we don't send him, like yeah. I said. Uh, um, you're getting out of my area of expertise. I believe there there are types of equipment that have been designed for that, but they largely come back to a sense of what is too odorous because there's no numerical standard against which we can benchmark. You know, uh, like in other in other media, EPA or DEC has promulgated a number you know, that says this is the number that we're using to regulate in your permit. There's not an odor number. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if you counted something, I'm not sure what that something necessarily tells you unless it comes back to, unfortunately, uh, you know, a, a somewhat subjective analysis as to whether, you know, it's too much. It's, it's too odorous, it's happening too often to too many people, and, and, and therefore you go to try to convince a judge that um, they've crossed that line. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, uh, are, can odors sometimes cause uh, health problems? Can they uh, cause somebody to become uh, ill, uh, even on a, on a temporary basis? Um, yes, I, when I was talking in my earlier comments, I mentioned that, you know, you can have odors that can give you acute, you know, temporary, you know, symptoms. You know, that can include, like, maybe headache, that can include nauseousness, um, that can include irritation, whether that's, you know, to the eyes, to the lungs, you know, and so those are certainly recognized, and in fact, you know, those are things we discussed when we had our conversation with New York State Department of Health. Mm -hmm. And so those are acknowledged. And then I guess, you know, the other thing that we were discussing, too, was more specifically, you know, the chronic long-term effects, or health effects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll reiterate again that based upon, you know, that information that New York State had studied, you know, back when they did their original analysis back in 1990, and then when they re more recently updated that in the context of why we're here, like right now, you know, their conclusion was unchanged mm -hmm. in terms of those long-term health effects. And have you ever been involved in anything that, uh, that w was there ever any equipment used to measure uh, odors uh, in, in any, uh, anything you've been involved with or that you're familiar, familiar with at the uh, Department of Health? No, not specifically, you know, with regards to, um, similar to the question I think that you were asking in terms of measurement and yeah. specific measurement and then tracking that and using that with some benchmark, no. Okay. Uh, now. Uh, list of chemicals, uh, formaldehyde, ben benzene, ethane, and uh, naphthalene. Uh, I don't know these chemicals very well myself. Uh, ethyl benzene, toluene, carbon monoxide, lead, manganese, manganese uh, mercury, nickel metal, uh, insoluble, con uh, in insoluble compounds. I'm going to skip to some uh, arsenic, beryllium, cadmium, chromium. Are, are any of these uh, dangerous chemicals? I think the short answer, you know, to your question is that, you know, most chemicals, including, you know, something as 
innocuous maybe as water, you know, can be um, harmful, you know, depending upon what the dose is and depending upon a person's susceptibility. Right. You know, so in many cases when you're talking about, you know, health impacts, you know, you're talking about exposure, you look at, you know, what is the concentration, what is the intensity, right. what is the susceptibility, um, and those are all maybe difficult to get of course. Um, when you're talking about yeah. any individual um, case. Yeah. And so that's part of the reason why beyond just looking at whether there is any impact whatsoever, you're looking at, if you will, dose, you're looking at certain standards yeah. similar to what was mentioned earlier. Yeah. But would long-term exposure to these chemicals be advisable? Or, or would they, is it, would it be, it would, would it be a good thing to be exposed to those chemicals on a long-term basis? And uh, well, I, you're saying completely in terms of the quantity, it depends on the quantity. I mean, it depends upon a number of things. You know, when you're talking about actual like, maybe dose, you know, that is effective enough to lead to a health impact. Um, right. We have a lot of things that are just in our ambient environment, including radiation. And we know that in a certain dose over a certain amount of time, that that can lead right. to cancer. But when we think about what's in the background environment, um, you know that you have a lot of things, things that are measured, and then a lot of things that we don't measure that we don't necessarily track yeah. consistently. Um, Mr. D'Amato, do you know what the, you know, in the permit, those are some of the chemicals that are per permitted to be uh, uh, emitted. Uh, do you know what the uh, quantities are for any of those? I can't find them in the, in the permit. And that's one of the questions I have is, why aren't these, uh, are they so small that they don't need to be listed, or is there some overriding law from the EPA or something that this refers to, but why, why aren't these listed in here in terms of permitted uh, emissions? I'm going to uh, ask our regional air pollution control engineer, Tom Merritt, to answer that. He's closer to the permit writing than, than I am. Thanks. The, uh, Tom, Tom, excuse me, if you wouldn't mind just coming up so that uh, we capture. The constituents you're referring to uh, are from an earlier version of the permit and were not actually part of the permit. That was mis There was a mistake made in that regard. However, those constituents in that list relate to uh, emissions that would occur with uh, number six fuel oil being burned. Okay. Number six fuel oil is a backup here which hasn't been used in, in, in many, many, many years and probably won't be for quite some time because of the, because of the cost. So. Those, it's a little misleading in that regard. Okay, that's very good. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I thank you for that. That clarifies a great deal because uh, uh, there was no way of determining from this whether this was part of the rendering process or if this was part of the fuel burning process uh, that, that's used. So that makes a big difference, I think. Um, let me see. Oh, I have a, a request, though, for. Uh, uh, for Mr. D'Amato, the, uh, the uh, permit has several areas uh, that are compliance, uh, compliance demonstrations where reports are required to be filed, and one of the conditions provides for public access to that information. Mm -hmm. Can that information be provided on your website? Is it something that you could uh, provide uh, on an ongoing basis on the website? We are trying to get better at putting more on our web website for uh, public access across the board, not just with respect to permit or uh, compliance reports. I'm not aware that these particular reports are currently getting posted. Um, they would be public information. You're more than uh, welcome to them. Um, and most of what we have uh, in our files, there are some exceptions and, uh, under the law with respect to the Freedom of Information Law, but most of this type of report you're referring to, um, reports from any of the companies we regulate, are, are typically, uh, unless there is a specific uh, piece of information that a company can justify as being confidential, which is pretty rare, um, those reports are, are typically public information. Um, uh, what I will do, however, is as we continue the discussion within DEC about trying to put more information on our website, I, I will uh, talk to our folks in Albany and, and see about that. I, I don't want to make any promises because the whole what gets posted and how to do it and how many people we have to do it is, is always an ongoing discussion. But 
but you can certainly get your hands on the materials if you're interested, and you're welcome to call my office if there's something okay, specifically so you're looking for. we wouldn't have to go through a Freedom of Information Act? Well, we do only because really. we try to track those requests, okay. and we try to make a case um, for more help in, in document management right. <laughs> based on how many uh, FOIA requests we get. To yeah. date, somewhat unsuccessful, but we're continuing to yeah. try. So we'll typically ask you to make that request that way we can also, you know, other than the, the tracking reason I just mentioned, we can make sure it gets to all of our divisions where a request may have documents because some requests may have, you know, a company may have an air permit, a water permit, um, you know, a solid waste permit, whatever. So it's, it's our way of, of making sh sure that it's less likely for something to fall through the cracks. But we do it electronically now. You can call. We'll give you our FOIL coordinators. Uh, information she'll email you a, uh, a public uh, access to records form and in five minutes you can make your request okay all right okay. well thank you very much yes. You're welcome and uh, also I'm, I'd like to say Bill we're all very optimistic with the changes that have occurred we appreciate that you, you know there is some change being done there and it seems to be making an effect uh, and we're all very hopeful that this will be a long-term process that uh, will con you know continue to bear fruit in this manner um, I, uh, I also want to uh, say I've really appreciated the people I've talked to in, in this neighborhood that uh, uh, I've never heard anybody say that they want to shut this plant down or anything. Everybody sees the value in terms of the recycling that's done there and that it's, uh, uh, that there's uh, very positive aspects to the plant and stuff. So I, I think that we can work together and keep this going, but I, I would really strongly encourage you to have representation from the neighborhood. Uh, on discussions in the future uh, because they'll feel like they're left out or that something's being discussed uh, in some manner that's uh, uh, some agreement's been made that, or whatever they want to they need to be a part of it and I think it would be better for everybody if they are um, so thank you very much thank you Jeff uh, there's no one else that uh, has signed up I got uh, Dr. Loveless first uh, then uh, Tim Murphy uh, so, and then uh, Steve Healy after that. So, Dr. Loveless. Vern Loveless, 19 Old West Fall Drive. Um, from the sounds of things from Mr. D'Amato, it sounds that this has gotten over being just a town problem, but this is now in the state purview. And this falls into something that I've been asking about for the last five years in our, our uh, stakeholders meetings, and that's solicitation of information from all of the adjacent uh, townships that uh, are, are around and lie within a two to three mile circle around the Baker commodities. One of my first suggestions when we first started to the stakeholders was we should solicit information from the town of Brighton, town of Rundequoit, and the city of Rochester to see if they're having the similar complaints. The downwind site that we reside in occupies relatively a 10 degrees of arc of a complete circle. And out of that, 190 complaints have been issued this year. If you extrapolate that our 10 degrees of arc is 136th of the total uh, circle, 36 times 190 is 6,840 potential complaints in a full 365-day year. I have asked for the, these towns to be solicited to give these neighborhoods the opportunity to complain and to have some sort of due process where their complaints are issued and counted relative to the overall problem that we've been dealing with for the last nine years of Baker. Multiple requests have failed to have any uh, response to do this. Um, now, how will the DEC notify these neighborhoods and their residents of the findings that we're going around here, the remedies that Baker says they're going to make, the plans for the future, and the punishment. They are all within this two to three mile circle around Baker, and they deserve to have the same knowledge that our small neighborhood has. Uh, Mr. Schmieder commented that um, they had the people in from uh, this company. They were trying to use the uh, chlorine dioxide to 
supplant the, uh, the agent that they were using for better odor control and they felt that it was going along well enough through 11 and 12 that they would um, install it in 2013. During 11 and 12, there were continual complaints that were issued and even though continual accounts with increasing numbers were being made, they chose to go ahead with a system with a chlorine dioxide, which they found at the end of a period of roughly 18 months was an abysmal failure with 190 complaints. So I find it very difficult to understand why they went ahead in the first place to try the chlorine dioxide when it never remediated the problems that we were dealing with through those two years of 2010 and 11. The note that came back to us from SCP had a listing of 10 issues that they were concerned about and they showed various shortcomings in the suction apparatus, the uh, sprayers and various things that I won't go into. But throughout the stakeholder meetings that I was part of, the representatives from Baker said that everything was up to snuff, everything was working with intermittent problems. If you look over that series of 10 issues that SCP reported on, it doesn't sound like they were ever doing what they said they were doing. And point of fact, we made a recommendation that they would use a disk um, thermometer reading for their uh, thermal oxidizer so that we could see if there was any correlation of odors to failure of the thermal oxidizer to maintain a temperature minimum. And we had them agree to uh, stamp date it so that it was officially entered in as such and such a date and the hours were correct. It sounds like from the SP SCP review, that was just another thing that was given lip service because that's part of their recommendations. I found it very dissettling to find that out several years later of what I was believing Bill to have truthfully said that they would do this and then find out that SCP found them remiss. Actually, I will say, Doctor, um, and I would ask uh, uh, DEC to comment as well, but I have been in uh, on a number of inspections and uh, one of the things that uh, we look at each one of those inspections are the disks. Uh, so they are stamped, they are time stamped as uh, we agreed as part of the stakeholder meeting. Uh, they are uh, all categorized so that you can go and pull uh, November 1st right through uh, November 17th and uh, you can see uh, when they fired up and uh, when they ran if there was a problem uh, similar to uh, a problem that occurred uh, uh, Friday apparently uh, where there was a, a, a hiccup with the, uh, the oxidizer. Uh, so all of that is there and that's part of the, the records that are checked uh, when, we, when in fact we go in and uh, take a look. And I've been at the last couple uh, myself uh, to be part of that process. And I, I, and I understand that, but they were cited for failure to use it on a continual and everyday basis. No, I don't understand that it, in, in the SCP memo, failure to use the t uh, temperature recording diskettes was listed as a failure that needed to be remediated. I'm, maybe I'm not the one to interpret it properly, but from my basic understanding, that was uh, stated in there. Vern, I don't recall that at okay. all. I, you I may be, but I will look that up and okay. I, I'll get back to you on that. One of the things that uh, bothered me <clears throat> relative to the health department is reviewing the past studies, not knowing if there's any change in components of what's going in the in basket at Baker Commodity. Basing your assessment of toxicity and various levels coming out of the stack on studies that were done in the 90s may not relate to what their input is today. That's assuming that there 
input is the same material, the same composition, and the same source. And as Mr. Reed alluded to, there's been changes in New York State and they're handling more material here. There may be different sources with different composition and the only way to know what's coming out of the stacks is to measure what's coming out of the stacks and assay that, which is not as difficult as one is led to believe. Um, to follow up on Mr. Reed's comment about the end of our stakeholder meeting, I remember it a little differently. I felt that Mr. LaFountain said that basically this was going to be the last stakeholder meeting it was a fait accompli, and we discussed this, but I felt, as Mr. LaFountain, that often we wind up going in circles, and I had no argument with him to stop the stakeholder meetings. Um, but it was, it was a decision that was made before the door was opened and the members came in, I felt but I don't disagree with the decision. Um, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Next person, uh, Tim Murphy, and then followed by Steve Healy. Good evening, Tim Murphy, 48 Corral Drive, and thank you for the forum tonight. Um, I wanted to offer a point of reference, a possible path forward, and then I have a question. I work at Thermo Fisher Scientific, uh, probably the largest employer here in town, and it's been drilled into me over the years, you can't control what you don't measure. So you know what that means, and you know, probably know where I'm going with this. Our company's moniker is we're, we, we make products for a safer, healthier, and cleaner world. So we have a uh, business unit now that uh, makes air quality monitoring equipment. So I, I took the initiative and I found the right person, a product manager, and we had a conversation. And, and I asked, why is this so difficult to, to get a handle on? And, and one of the comebacks was, well, because there's over 100 gases in a rendering plant typically, and, and odors are made up of gases, there's a wide spectrum. And that wide spectrum demands a number of different instruments. So it's not possible to pick something off the shelf, go and monitor. You have to have somebody with capabilities and lots of resources. Um, but they're out there today. They exist. He offered up what's happening in New York City. At the City College of New York, they have a collaboration to work with uh, local authorities and businesses to monitor. And then he went into some deep explanation, and I don't get it all, probably you would, but what he did say, what was terribly important, is you do a bag capture. Are you familiar with that term? Where you go directly to the stack or vent and you capture what the emissions are. He also said that it was terribly important to do it without notice because there's a cat and mouse game that tends to happen. As you can imagine, if you know somebody's coming to, to take a look at your operations, you probably are going to do some fine tuning at minimum. So, so he said it would be terribly important to have the DEC on board to, to, to have a random, a random appearance at a time when maybe the operation wasn't prepared at, at optimum to, to, uh, to deal with this. There are tools like gas chromatographs, max, max, mass spectrometers, that would, in fact, show the gases. So get back to you can't control what you don't measure. So uh, what I'd like to ask is would the DEC and the Monroe County Department of Health be willing to organize some kind of relationship, whether it be with RIT and, and U of R, who we both know have environmental studies programs, to do something like this? And finally, just for a point of reference, I asked the product manager, how much would it cost to do something like this? Thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, or hundreds of thousands of dollars? The answer was tens of thousands of dollars. Now, timing is everything, and I just happened to pick up the paper today, and I saw the, one of the lead articles about how, you know, towns are stashing money. You know, the town of Penfield, I had it wrong. I thought it was $3.6 million in the fund balance. It's actually $4.6 million. So just some quick math, if, even if you spent $50,000, that would be only 1% of, of your surplus funds. So the question is, would the DEC and the Monroe County Health Department be willing to do something like that, to lead a consortium, 
to do some testing because you can't control it unless you test it. I'd like an answer, please. Do you want to talk about the stack test? You're talking about doing stack testing? The, the term the term that was used was a bag test, bag capture. Uh, see, that's not a stack testing method for the most part. There are many federal reference testing methods of which that's not necessarily one of them. And also there aren't standards to use once, once you made a measurement. So we always felt there was a better, uh, better use of spending money for correcting the problem, putting it into the equipment, things of that nature, as opposed to testing where it can be done, but it's, it, it doesn't give you, you can't measure, the, the list of constituents that you look for is long, there are some different methods, it's a difficult, it can be difficult depending on what the constituents are, and we always felt it was better to, to put, put the efforts into the into correction of the problem. But again, sir, how do you control if you can't measure? Well. With odors, it's difficult to measure. That's really what we're talking about here, odors. Odors are gases, correct? In, yes. But it's, it's just difficult to, 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 uh, to control. Well, what I would offer, sir, is again, I could make that connection to the product manager who I had this conversation with that shared with us that there are instruments, again, a wide spectrum of instruments, not one, but many, that you would have to bring to bear to capture these gases, which comprise the odors, which in turn, you can develop a baseline and measure. Right. And what, do you, what do you do with them after you've got them? I would, I would imagine you, again, create a baseline so you know where you are at any point in time. I guess you can only look forward. But at least you would have something that tell you how many parts per million or whatever the, me the, uh, the measurement term is to, to begin to look and say, hey, where are we now you versus have, where were we? Concentrate. Yeah, but the thing is that there's nothing enforceable in that regard. You just have some information. Now, if you want to ha have somebody do a, a research project, that's one thing. But in terms of enforceable limits, the, the, the process to establish standards uh, are very lengthy. It takes, it takes years to be able to do that. That's where the difficulty comes in. So if you're doing it as a research project, that's one thing. Doing it as something that might be enforceable is something else. I'll walk away if I get an answer. Would, uh, would the DEC and uh, the Monroe County Department of Health be willing to at least look at putting some kind of collaboration together to do some measurements? Well, we'd be willing to participate in any discussion that somebody wanted to bring forward that would have the resources and the money to to start that conversation. I don't want to overcommit because my the advice I've received from our people is that without collected data being meaningful in terms of either odor control or um, any other regulatory purpose, it's, it's, it's largely information gathering without a lot of uh, a meaningful result. However, if, you know, if a group was willing to go forward and solicit a university or find some other uh, mechanism to take a look and if the company was willing to uh, give you access to do that we would we would we would engage the conversation so you said resources and money can you explain what you mean by resources well people, people? with the talent to uh, do something meaningful um, we've heard you know send the kids out that are in college to determine this and there's limited capacity going down that avenue but um, you know, we're not here to foreclose a discussion about anything. So if, if some serious suggestion was made where we'd be able to understand the end result, 
and what was being asked of us was manageable in terms of our own resources and capacity and capability, we'll be, we'd be glad to sit down with you and talk about it. It's about as far as I can go tonight. I'm sorry. You may want more. Is this, is this equipment you sell? The thermal it pressure is. cells? Yes, it is. Not locally, Tony, but yes, absolutely. Okay. So, so, so that was a definite maybe. Sorry, go ahead, sir. No, and I said from the health department's perspective, I mean, our role is certainly maybe to do what we can to sort of ensure maybe the health and safety of the broader community that includes all of Monroe County. And so maybe I'm too, and, and to that extent, you know, as I mentioned, I guess maybe earlier, specifically with regards to some of the um, ambient air um, health impacts, you know, where the state has more experience, you know, certainly engage them in some potential um, efforts along those, along those lines. And to the extent, you know, that we can help, you know, um, guide or provide, I guess, maybe input, you know, we're willing to do that for anything that has a, a potential positive impact on the community. But I will also say, too, that um, specifically when you're talking about the monitoring of uh, ambient air quality and those standards, that's not, that's necessarily outside maybe the purview of the Monroe County D Department of Public Health. And that's pretty much maybe the case when you look across local jurisdictions in the state of New York. Depending upon where you are, maybe in the country, you may have more of a local role with regards to that monitoring of, you know, um, outdoor air. But in the state of New York, you know, um, we don't. So, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, and correct me if I'm wrong, so what I thought I heard is that you would gladly sit at the table if invited, but you wouldn't take a leadership position. Um, we have not seen the return on that investment as we've thought about that over the years, so I think that's an accurate characterization of what I'm saying. If, if, if there were proposals put together, we'd certainly be willing to uh, lend what we could to that discussion in terms of what it might mean, um, but but we're uh, not in a position to uh, pound our fist and demand it at this point because we're not uh, convinced that's a meaningful path to go down. Mr. Supervisor, so that leaves the town. Would the town be willing to organize uh, a meeting to? to start a conversation around measure it? I think, I think uh, this board has indicated that uh, certainly they are willing to have any conversations on this. I mean, certainly the thing we're trying to do and the reason we're here tonight uh, is to try to address, you know, the situation. So certainly, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's always good to continue communications and keep communications open. And uh, so uh, to that end and to uh, the end of uh, trying to make sure that uh, folks, uh, you know, in, enjoy uh, Baker continues uh, to be able to uh, operate the business they operate. Our residents uh, are able to enjoy uh, their, their properties. Uh, we can uh, uh, minimize, uh, I'm going to stop short of total elimination, but to do everything we can to get it back to what a number of people have uh, said uh, here this evening at a time where uh, we didn't know that uh, Baker existed or, or were, in, were in operation. And so uh, to have that ongoing uh, dialogue uh, to, to, to learn and look for ways uh, to meet that end, uh, yes, uh, the answer is yes. So we need to huddle up probably with the neighbors and then reach out and, and, and organize some kind of session. What I would imagine it'd be someone much more knowledgeable than me and probably most of us in the room about what the possibilities are in terms of air quality uh, monitoring. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that I have that all mapped out uh, as to what to do right now, Tim. Uh, but uh, that'll, that'll certainly be something that uh, we'll have some uh, further conversation. Open to the so. conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Steve Healy. Tony, Bill, Paul, Byron, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Tony, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Steve. The, uh, you know, it's, it's tough being on the hot seat. I've been there. I have empathy for you guys. I've been a plant manager in biotech. I've worked in the industries, in, in the industry. I've been in the Rossay plant in Canada that was giant compared to the Baker plant. I've seen pig carcasses piled as high as the ceiling, probably higher, and moved around with front loaders. So I've got some experience in this, all right? So, you know, I want to focus first on the good news. And the good news is there's no orders right now, right? 
the funny part about that, though, it was like a switch was flipped, right? And it was like a switch was flipped in 2005, too. So something changed in 2005, and then something suddenly changed again. Seriously, I find it hard to believe it's tuning scrubbers, quite honestly. So, Bill, I would ask you directly, can you tell me honestly that this has nothing to do with the operation of the TOs and cost cutting to try to, to be more cost effective? Well, I've always been honest, so you wouldn't have to ask that question, Stephen, but um, <clears throat> we have our thermal oxida oxidizer is regulated. Actually, we, we operate at a temperature and we have chart recorders to provide and prove that temperature. And there really is no reason not to maintain that temperature. As I've spoken earlier in this session, our operation is very dependent on steam generation. A thermal <coughs> oxidizer is one of our main sources of steam generation. Um, without that, we don't make steam. We've got other alternative, we've got other boilers that supplement it, mm -hmm. but there's no reason to that for us to not make steam and capture the steam from that thermal oxidizer. So to answer your question, you know, it, it has a hiccup every now and again, and a component may, may break down, and we'll have to replace or do repairs, schedule repairs. Yeah. But no, we don't operate, or yes, we do operate that at the, at the control temperature of 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Aren't there two TLs? Don't you have two different boilers that you use as TLs? We have, we have three boilers. We have uh, two that can be used as a TL, yes. So you have two, basically, boilers that you use as TLs. We have the capacity to use two, yes. Do you generally use one? Correct. And then when do you use the second? That's our spare boiler. We haven't used that. You know, we, don't, we don't generally use that boiler. It's a spare So you generally boiler. just use one TO? Yes, we always okay. have. So then you would have records of the usage of that TO, right? Which one? The one that you use primarily. Oh, sure. Yeah. So then, I mean, if, if the TOs have been operated the same pre-2005, post-2005, and after the SCP visit, that would be able to be shown with records. We have records. So that would put the TO thing to rest. If you guys could share those records pre-2005, after 2005, and after the SCP visit, if those records prove to be the same across that whole course of time, then that would put the TL thing to rest, right. and I wouldn't be plaguing you anymore about it. Well, we have a regulatory agency through the DEC that we comply with uh, through permit conditions, and uh, I believe it's part of their function to ensure that that TO is running at those temperatures, and they go back um, whenever there's an audit or a visit, and be it random or, or scheduled, they review those, um, and, and they have, I don't, I'm sure they've gone back I've been there 25 years, Steve, and I, and I know they've, since then, they've been looking at those records. So I can't speak for anyone else, but um, they're available. Well, that's good. That's great news. You know, to Tim's point, Jeff's point, let's get objective here. Let's get some objective information that we can put some issues to rest. One of the issues that would be great to put to rest is the function of the TO, and that has been run similarly across that whole period of time. Then that issue's done. So I would suggest to Tom and to Paul to pursue those records, put them on the table, and prove unequivocally that this is not an issue. Then we're done with it. Let me put it away. <clears throat> so next, uh, are you guys all Baker employees? Yeah? We want you to keep your jobs. We're not trying to take anything away from you. All we want to do is live in a neighbor-free, a odor-free neighbor neighborhood. That's all. We want you guys to keep your jobs. Okay? That's, that's what we want. We want to live odor free. We want Baker to stay in operation. We want the people to keep their jobs. Okay? So, Paul, you and I have exchanged a, a few emails. They've been constructive. So, I'm trying to stay that way. Right? Okay. So, you know, this, the good part here is we have a short term solution at the very least. Right? We've got no orders. What we want to make sure is that this stays a long term solution. So for us, that means there's going to be a monitoring, <coughs> monitoring, compliance, and enforcement plan, right? We would like to be part of creating that plan and working with you to do that. 
one of the things I would suggest is part of that plan would be some objective measures for the permit, right? Number of complaints. There should be a baseline number of complaints. That's an objective measure that should be part of the permit, right? We shouldn't have to get to some unlimited number of complaints for them to be in violation. That would be an objective measure, right? That record needs to be kept by somebody, right? Maybe the town keeps the record. I've given some very specific recommendations for how the odor control log could be kept and how that data could be analyzed and how that analysis could be used to solve problems. You've seen it in the emails. I shared it with everybody, okay? Another idea is <clears throat> plan capacity should be part of the permit. There should be some measure of plan capacity that's quantified in the permit and is monitored by the DEC. Is that in there now, Paul, do you know? I don't believe so offhand. I, I couldn't say with certainty. I don't have the permit yeah. with me. But my point is if we could get some objective measures in the permit, that would serve us all. It would make your job a, little, a lot easier, right? We've got this nebulous measure now uh, or comment in there now. It's very hard to, to enforce or assess. And the burden of proof is on the citizens, right? So what that points to is we need some objective measures in the permit. Right? There's got to be a monitoring and compliance and enforcement plan that speaks to the permit and there's objective measures in the permit that can help institute some action. Is that reasonable? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Like I said, we're in the process of, of taking a look at um, you know, making enforceable permit conditions out of some of the monitoring and measuring that uh, Bill spoke about earlier. Um, we will be modifying the permit to incorporate those, and we have not um, finished the deliberation over how much should change in that permit. So we'll take a look at your emails. I don't want to, you know, make promises here tonight till I have an opportunity to talk to to my staff. And there's a process associated with modifying a permit, but we'll take a look at the emails and yeah. and see what you're saying. I mean, I'm not sure a capacity number um, is is the answer because as, as the supervisor said earlier, you know, <clears throat> what you can put through that plant is limited by the capacity of the equipment. So unless, you know, unless you're changing operating hours or working over the weekends or doing things different operationally, that throughput number is probably going to be self-limiting and you know if you're processing a little bit less today and have some other kind of a problem it could stink <laughs> and tomorrow you could be processing twice as much you know without a, a problem so I, I I don't know that that number is um, yet a big part of the answer but we'll certainly take a look at it think about it and and um, you know we like has been said by many people <coughs> Um, there is a beneficial aspect of what this company does in terms of keeping this material out of the landfills, which we also regulate. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I don't want to get so restrictive just to be more popular unless there's going to be uh, a return on that. Uh, you know, for, for the odor control situation and for the neighborhood. Yeah. And again, you know, I'm not trying to pin you down, right? I'm trying to do is offer some suggestions here. Yes, you are, here. But, that, but we understand yeah, how this you works. Know, I've and been where you are. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying right. to pin you to the wall tonight. If I was what worried about it, I wouldn't have come. Uh, what's that? If I was worried about that, I wouldn't be here. So it, it's fine. It's yeah. absolutely fine. But what I'm trying to do is give some concrete suggestions to consider. And some of these are from tonight. They're not in my emails. Okay. That's fine. But, you know, as part of a, you know, as a former plant manager, I can tell you where capacity does come into play. You overload your equipment. You put too much through, you overload your equipment, you overload your odor control equipment, you have odors. So capacity is important, right? So I would suggest that capacity is a key parameter to having the permit. I would suggest that number of odor complaints is a key parameter to having the permit. 
I would further suggest, let me give you some of this stuff. This is uh, from the Georgia Department of Agriculture about their rendering motor control program. Right? This is from Render Magazine right? about how BioRen measured odors right? and helped the Ross A plant meet and, and exceed what they had to do because they had too, many, too much residential development. They had the same problem they had and they solved it with BioRen. Right? And here's the list of chemicals. It's a short list of 16. Right? But they can be broken down into basic classes of gametes and captains and sulfides. Right? Some things can be measured here without all that much direction expense, I believe. <clears throat> so I would also suggest that as part of the permit and part of the compliance plan, that there's a requirement for an independent third party to come in if the odors come back, if the odors come back, there's a requirement for a truly independent third party analysis of root cause, root cause. And that involves the whole plant, a full PFD, process flow diagram, including the process, including the scrubbers, including the TO or TOs, right? That's another concrete suggestion for a compliance plan. Again, objective measures in the permit will trigger action. But I just I just want to ask something, Steve, if I if I can about yeah. that because there's been the concern, uh, you know, about this independent third party. I mean, it, it's it's routine, as you know, as a former plant manager, it's routine for us to expect that the companies we regulate will hire the consulting expertise that they need to comply with the law. I mean. I, I'm no expert in the rendering business, but um, I didn't see any reason to not give this company shot. Uh, a shot. Sure. Uh, they didn't look, they certainly didn't look unqualified to me. And in fact, from the little bit I was able to ascertain, the internet's a wonderful thing. Um, you know, this is uh, right in their wheelhouse. So, I mean, are you s suggesting that the neighbors have some inherent problem with SCP or you're just saying if this fails, let's move to another step. That's all I'm saying. Okay. So I you know I knew you had to go forward with SCP SCP. What I'm saying is if it comes back, then I think we need a truly independent party, not paid by Baker. And it's gonna be a root cause analysis, not just focused on the scrubbers. That's the point. Okay. Okay. And <clears throat> Byron, I would ask you, dose is a function of concentration and duration. Correct? Those are components. Huh? Those are components. What are the arrest? What are the other things? Dose, concentration, duration. What else is part of dose in your definition? I guess you're looking at, you know, like intensity as well. You know, so if you have something that's like low intensity but over a long period of time, that's an intensity type. a measure of concentration? Well, it depends. You know, concentration depends upon what parameter, you know, you're looking at. So concentration in terms of how many maybe molecules that you might have in a certain fixed space. Okay, let's um, use parts per million. That's one piece, but then the other thing is, you know, like when you look over time, yeah. not only maybe the entire duration, but also just if you have like certain pulses where you may have like a very high dose, then it may go really low, then it goes very high, then it goes yeah. really low. So there's a cycle in there potentially. But for simple reasons, I mean, for simple purposes, dose is really a function of concentration and duration if the if the if it's steady, if there's no up and down, right? If you assume that it's steady state, yes. So it's, let's assume it's steady state. So dose is a function of concentration and duration, correct? Correct. So, you know, back to objective measures. We're talking about emissions here, right? And we're talking about very high intensity odors in our neighborhood. And we've got a lot of hand waving that it's not a harmful problem for us. But hand waving isn't data. It would be very useful to have some sort of emissions testing at the plant without getting all wrapped around stack testing or bag testing or whatever. It's basically what's in the ambient air coming out of those stacks that's going into our neighborhood. If the concentration is low enough that there's no question that it's not toxic, then the, the, then the debate is over, right? The debate's over. But we would need to be part of when is that going to be tested? If there's no odors, <laughs> there's no sense testing it, 
right? So that again, I think, plays into modifying the permit and a compliance plan. If the odors come back full force the way they were, why wouldn't we do some emissions testing to see what the concentration is at the very least, the concentration and duration at the stack or coming out of the Baker plant? And prove that the neighbors are not in danger. Would you guys be amenable to that? You know, as I had mentioned, I guess maybe earlier when you're talking about the monitoring of ambient air, you know, that's really not a specific function for, in, the, in New York State, for anyway, a local health department. Who you know, is it a function of? Is it the EPA? Well, in terms of, you know, our role, I guess maybe is to look at the overall health for the community, including the county. But then when you're talking about indoor and the monitoring of that, that's not Monroe County Department of Public Health. So, I mean, you guys are the authorities we're dealing with, so who would have the purview to see if our neighborhood is being exposed to a toxic level of amines and mercaptans and aldehydes and sulfides? Can anybody help with that? I guess I'd, I guess I'd look uh, for any input feedback. I, I don't. I don't have a good answer for that, uh, Steve. I can. No. I can list off a lot of agencies, give you a lot of acronyms, uh, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, if I know who that. Uh, you know who that uh, one sole oh, agency they. is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess one of the difficulties is, is kind of, attempting, you know, in a, in a redraft of a permit, to try to anticipate you know, what circumstances you might be trying to address with that because you don't know, you know, which material may be odorous. You don't know if if many of these materials, and I'll confess, I'm way out of my area of expertise in terms of toxicology, but for the most part, my understanding is that we're talking about, you know, rotting flesh without a lot of chemical or maybe any chemical additive in the process so you know are those materials inherently problematic you know at the level at which you can smell them you know at the at the level at which the odor is overpowering at the level at which you can't smell them i mean it, it's it's what's the target i mean is what we continue to struggle with, with this question about testing i mean if there was a a consensus by people who are expert in this field which i am not mm -hmm. um that that you could achieve something by it, yeah. so be it. But I mean, I, I, you know, the, the sort of let's write a condition that says if it smells again, we're going to do that, you know, is, yeah, I is guess I, in some ways you're better off reacting when you have the facts in front of you than trying to write the be all and end all permit that anticipates any number of possible scenarios. But I mean, I, I understand the point. I, I'm, I'm stammering a little bit because it's hard to it's hard to nail something like that down, especially with uh, a parameter, if you can even call it like that, of you know of stench, riding flesh stench. But yeah, but, but I understand you know, but I certainly understand. Yeah. The thing is, know, with the, 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 the rotting the, flesh, the it's the breakdown products that become toxic. Yeah. They decompose. They become other chemicals. So it's the toxicity of things like mercaptans and aldehydes and sulfides, which are part of the breakdown products. Yeah. So at some level, they do become toxic. The question is, what concentration level do they become toxic? What duration? What overall dose? There should be some objective measure of that. We listed 16. They can be broken down into broad categories from amines, mercaptans, and sulfides. There could be a simple test devised to measure a certain subset of these chemicals and see what the concentration is. It wouldn't have to be that hard. Right? It really wouldn't have to be that hard. I'm just suggesting it as another means of compliance and pot potentially enforcement. But even more importantly, just to assure the neighbors that there really is not a toxicity issue. All right? So, and then I, the, uh, the, the paper that I gave you there from Render Magazine talks about the uh, unit that BioREM installed at the ross -A plant up in Canada. I was part of that. I was part of the pilot testing for that. And there is a way to measure odor. There is a way to measure odor units. And they talk about it in there. BioREM and other companies like that in the rendering industry could help with actually um, measuring odor units. 
right? So that could be another objective measure that could be part of the permit or part of the compliance plan. So there's a number of objective me measures that could be part of the compliance plan, be, be part of a revised permit, in some way structured in, so it becomes more objective and then there's a trigger. That's the point, okay? Throwing out ideas, I'll summarize some of this stuff in an email back to you, Paul. Okay. All right? Thanks. And uh, dinner still stands, okay? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thanks, Steve. Steve. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Paula Metzler, uh, Town Board. Good evening, Paula Metzler from the Penfield Town Board. I don't have a product to try to sell to you. And uh, although I'm an attorney, you've had enough cross-examination for tonight. So Thank I you. will <laughs> avoid, I'll try to avoid um, cross-examination. Um, I think um, what stands out to me here is certainly um, we all have a commitment to solving this problem. We have a, uni a unified commitment to solving this problem. We have different ideas as to how to do that. But the bottom line is we have residents who've come here tonight, taken the time out of their schedules to hear how this problem is going to be solved and how in the future it won't come back again. Um, I submit to you that although I've been on the town board since 2005 and um, Mr. Reed has brought up history that goes back to my years in elementary school in Penfield. So I can't speak to, to too much of the history, but I think we need to start moving forward and looking forward, but not forgetting um, what has happened in the past. I'd submit to you that nine years and the hundreds of violations of, of recent especially is unacceptable. And Mr. D'Amato, this is your chance to take the wheel and fix this and make sure that that doesn't happen again, either through permit um, renegotiation, permit revision. Um, this is your chance to do that. And I hope that we have your commitment um, to this area to do that, to do just that. Um, I think that it, although, as I said, it's important to recognize the past, we get hung up on the past. We're getting hung up on what has happened in the past. Um, what has happened most recently is good news. We've only had one complaint come through. Um, there has to be a reason for that. And um, I just, in terms of precedence, again, I'm an attorney, so I, I, I research in terms of precedent. I look in terms of precedent um, going forward. I think it's important that we recognize um, precedent for a couple reasons. One, to see um, that type of action like this can be successful, that problems can be solved when it comes to odor problems. And also to make sure, as I represent the, the community of Penfield, that Penfield is getting its fair share of DEC action that other communities have gotten across the state. Um, in the research that I did regarding this problem, um, there were recent um, instances um, touted by Attorney General Schneiderman as um, being cases where odors were, odor problems were solved for communities by the DEC and the AG working together. Um, I want, um, Mr. DeMau, for you to assure us that you will make that same commitment for Penfield. Well, I think I, there's no question we have the commitment to uh, continue to work on this problem. We're, we're hopeful we've turned the corner already. It would make all of our lives easier, especially the people sitting out there. Um, but sure, we're committed, and as I said in, in my remarks earlier, that we've not promised to uh, uh, not pursue, pardon the double negative counselor, um, legal action if it, if it comes to that. Um, if, that involve, if that means the Attorney General, um, we, uh, we've done it before. I've, I've been at this since you were in elementary school, and uh, I was an attorney in my past as well. So. Um, you know, we're, we're committed to um, not being here nine years from now. Let's put it that way. And I think and that's a, a lesson learned as you go forward in permit review. Um, that I believe there is some sort of, of quantitative or objective criteria that can be put forth, even if it's done with agreement, by agreement with the company, you know, by mm -hmm. some sort of consent agreement um, of operation moving forward as part of the permitting process. Um, I, I'm certainly we all know that if we can come to an agreement, it's much easier than having someone tell you what to do um, or going through enforcement through litigation. 
Um, I just wanted to, for those who here who haven't heard this story before, um, this is a story, uh, most recent story, um, that might sound familiar to some here. Um, a company had cast a shadow over a community for too long. This is Attorney General Schneiderman speaking. Offensive nuisance odors and omissions had long plagued residents, interfering with such basic pleasures as opening windows and enjoying backyards. This will reassure the community that the company will never again pollute their air or disrupt their lives. With this action, Attorney General Schneiderman's office is standing with the residents to protect their right to enjoy fresh air. And what happened in this instance was the DEC referred the matter of odors to the Attorney General for enforcement when it became clear that despite the company's efforts, the company was continuing to cause a continuing violation of DEC laws and regulations. So my point is, this is involving the Amagon Funeral Home in our neighboring, uh, in Erie County of Tonawanda. Um, certainly the DEC, when it came to a funeral home causing noxious odors for a period of time, and I don't believe as long as Baker's has been causing odors in um, our community, um, they took a stand, the DEC, it doesn't look like there was any specific objective other than um, pervasive odors that had plagued the neighborhood, um, causing that referral. So at what point in time, I ask you, does the DEC refer a matter to the Attorney General's office? Well, like I, like I said before, we, we try to use our best judgment as to whether that case is uh, uh, provable, who we have as witnesses who are willing to take the time and effort to uh, participate because as you know counselor with these uh, nuisance cases it's really the the citizens that have to carry the load um, we make our best judgment and when we think it's over the line we make that referral to the attorney general's office I know people would like me to say when I hit a certain number of complaints on the log, it's automatically a referral, but there's more judgment uh, in that. There's more analysis as to, as to what's gone you know, right or wrong, uh, the credibility of witnesses and all the things you go through in your professional life. So I can't sit here and say you know, there's an X number, but what I can hear, sit here and say is that um, we are committed to stay with this until we know it's no longer a problem. As I, as I said to Steve in one of my emails, you know, I, I think it'd be dishonest to sit here and say, there'll never be an odor from an operation like Baker. But I do think it's fair for people to expect that all of us sitting up here will, will stay with this thing until we're comfortable that, you know, we've, we've addressed the nuisance. And, and, and we'll do that. And as I said before, I, I, I honestly hope, I mean, as much as, as, you know, I have the same background and training as you do, uh, as much as, uh, despite that, I, I, I really hope it doesn't come down to litigation because it's, it's, it's lengthy, it's costly, and, uh, and, and it, it, it polarizes the sides <coughs> instead of um, creating a situation where we can, can work together to resolve it. And I, and I personally, I very much appreciate uh, the, the position taken by a lot of commenters tonight that, that they're not looking to shut down Baker, that they recognize the value that the company brings uh, um, in terms of, of the employment of some of the people in this room, but also the, the, the recycling of that material. So I think people are asking for a reasonable result. Yeah, I you think know? also, though, so. it is important to inform people that just litigation in and of itself, starting a case, does not necessarily make it lengthy and protracted or expensive. Um, in this case, they did not go to trial. What the litigation, the start of litigation, the AG's office pulling, pulling the trigger, so to speak, on prosecution got the attention of the company to then come to an agreement by which they were able to operate and perform and solve the problem that had that plagued the neighborhood. So I would, I would correct the record, pardon the pun, that um, I, I don't like to talk about litigation necessarily in terms of long, protracted, expensive, because that scares people. And it scares people who are potential witnesses or want to bring things forward. Uh, litigation often, and more often than not, 
in civil litigation, it, correct me if I'm wrong, brings about agreement and settlement and better, better discourse for the future. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Anyone else who has not spoke the first time? Andy Moore from our town board. First, I'd just like a, to take a minute and thank you all for being here tonight. I think the discussion really helped shed some light on every entity's perspective in the, the situation. And I think that you know what you're hearing today is everybody's on the same page. They want this problem resolved. We're moving in the right direction over the last couple months, last 60 days or so. Hopefully that will continue. Um, just a couple things, if I can, real quickly, going back to some earlier statements. Um, I'm glad to see, for Baker Commodities, I'm glad to see that uh, you're making the effort to purchase some new equipment, uh, particularly more monitoring equipment. So we certainly appreciate that. Also, happy to, uh, to, for you to inform us that you're going to be performing some more tests. So I think that's uh, something that will help um, you know, try to resolve this issue from a Baker Commodities perspective. Also with the state DEC, um, I'm glad to hear, you know, your commitments. If, and correct me if I'm wrong, some of the things that you talked about um, was requiring uh, revisits by the consultant into 2015 um, with the DEC present during those visits. Also, um, the new equipment that uh, Baker Commodities will be purchasing or leasing um, will be maintained to new standards that will be incorporated in the DEC's permit. Um, also, um, you know, better monitoring of, of complaints, the complaint log that the town maintains, and more frequent inspections. So I think those are good steps forward in the short term uh, for a long-term solution. So I thank you for making those commitments uh, to the residents here tonight and those watching on television. Um, just one, a, a couple quick things if I can. Again, moving towards um, Baker Commodities. Uh, Mr. Smeeter, I know I thought I read a couple years ago that the rendering plant, um, uh, there's two products, as you mentioned earlier, that comes in. There's the animal product, and then there's also the grease fats and oils that come from the restaurants that we all go to uh, throughout this community. Is there a percentage that goes through your um, facility that would be a percentage of the restaurant greases, fats, and oils compared to the percentage of um, animal remains? Of course. W w can you share that percentage with us, what that would be? Mm, I don't have a, uh, <clears throat> a calculation. 20%, uh, 50%, I'm not sure. I'd have, to, I'd have to get back to you on that, Andy. Okay, if I you could, that sure. would be great. I would, I would personally be interested in knowing um, how much is actual restaurant oil, grease, and fats compared to what you know, is commonly perceived as the animal product that goes through the rendering plant. And why, why would that be? I'm sorry? Why would that be? Uh, I'm just interested in knowing which which is which. Okay. So I, I think there may be. Do you have a specific be... question on an odor, one versus the other? Or? No. Okay. No, not at all. It's just a, a personal question, and I would expect that you would be willing to give us an answer on that. I said so, I would, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, in summary, a, a couple comments that I wanted to share with um, this group here tonight is I think that there really could be some solutions, some easy solutions to resolving this problem. Um, maybe, uh, you know, a suggestion would be have SPC, you know, perform and conduct some more testing, some more thorough testing. If the DEC is willing to modify the permit, the existing permit, the permit that was written, I believe, in 1999, then maybe there's an opportunity there to put some language in there for stronger testing and more thorough testing. Um, you know, something to think about again, other people have talked about encouraging having a third party um, engineer come in for review. Maybe that's a, a simple solution to resolve the problem. Um, certainly, I'm confident in your response, the DEC's response, with the expertise of the current consultant, but 
again, maybe there's an opportunity there to have another third party consultant come in and we can compare the findings. Um, I would also encourage the state DEC to routine, routinely perform unannounced inspections. I think that would be a good idea. Um, if you were to modify the permit, which you've stated before, um, certainly reevaluate the entire permit and see if it does need updating. 19 years is, I'm sorry, the permit was, was uh, put together in 1999. It's, it's a long time ago. I think there may be some new language in there that could be more uh, relevant to current times. Um, the state DEC has an enormous amount of influence in this process, and, and I appreciate the efforts that, that you've put forward, and particularly being here tonight. Um, you know, some of the language in the DEC permit talks about inspections. It talks about air quality. It talks about the DEC's ability to revoke, modify, or suspend the permit, and it talks about emissions. And those are important parts of the permit that I think everybody should take seriously. A couple of the speakers before talked about the permit and one of the you know, paragraphs in the permit. And I think this says a lot to the people you know, around this community. And it, and it is under item 29.1, page 25. And it talks about, you know, no person shall cause or allow emissions of air contaminants to outdoor atmosphere of such quantity, characteristic, or duration, which are injurious to human, plant, or animal life or to property, or which unreasonably interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property. And that's really what we're looking for tonight, is steps forward so we can resolve this problem. And I, again, I appreciate your attendance here tonight and your commitment to reaching that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Is there anyone else that has not spoken yet that would like to speak I'm, I'm looking i'm looking for one-time speakers first steve any one-time first-time speakers going once going twice okay steve you've got uh you've got the first first opportunity to be the second time speaker so paul will you work with us and baker and tony on a compliance plan um i'm not we use compliance plan as a term of art, maybe different than you are, but okay. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll work with, with Tony and, and anybody uh, else that he wants to put together on this issue till it's resolved. So okay. if you want to, whatever you want to call it or whatever yeah. comes out of it, um, you know. So the idea is to monitor, get compliance, enforce. Yeah, and, 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 and do things that we're getting a return on, on what we're doing and not doing it for, you Make know, work. for show. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's got to be uh, totally workable and meaningful and, 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 and uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, Tony, would you be leading that from here? Like, what are the next steps so we can move forward on we'll, some uh, sort of we'll, plan? We'll certainly, uh, uh, Paul and I will have some discussions uh, on that, uh, Steve, and then, you know, we can report uh, back out uh, back out through the, uh, you know, the email distribution list. Sure. Just want to make sure we have some concrete next steps and we keep it moving together. Okay? Yep. Yep. I'll let you go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other second time uh, speakers? Jeff Burns. Thank you. Just a quick question for clarification. I'm sorry, I've forgotten what this gentleman's name on the end is. Uh, Tom Marriott. Tom, Tom, uh, I just want to clarify. So that condition for the contaminant list, um, do you have a, you're familiar with that, you seem to be very familiar with it when I brought it up. Uh, are, I don't have that number right Okay. Um, are you, am I correct in understanding that these are all related only to the uh, energy that's used uh, you know, that it was oil that was used as a uh, backup uh, way of firing the boilers uh, and that it has nothing to do with the rendering uh, emissions, that this is, this is unrelated to rendering emissions. Is that correct? Okay. Now, there, there's one here that I, I wonder about, and I, I, I wonder if we can get clarification on it, and that's, uh, or maybe a couple of them, sulfur dioxide and hydrogen chloride. Uh, you had 
mentioned that there was chlorine dioxide that was that was what was used in the scrubbers for for a bit. Uh, do those leave? Uh, is that are, are there some emissions from that? I recall being in a meeting, I think about a year ago, where somebody came up and said that they smelled chlorine on occasion. So, uh, is the was the chlorine dioxide the uh, the root of that, is that something that's common in a uh, rendering plant that somebody might smell chlorine uh, at some point? Oh, I'll take that. Um, <clears throat> it's not common, no. Okay. I mean, <clears throat> there, we, we handle chlorine. Um, we use a uh, chlorine-based solution. So uh, from time to time, if the setting uh, happened to be higher or there was a delivery, possibly you could. Okay, so uh, in terms of these emissions, may that might that be part of the rendering emission rather than the uh, uh, heating source, or or if was this? Or, or the, well, if you're talking about the materials used for like the scrubber solution, and then yes, I mean I think that okay. would be part of the the rendering operation because it's used right. in the in the scrubbers. I think what Tom was alluding to, correct me if I'm wrong, was the many of the components on that right. list are components in in fuel oil right and right. that's and, and okay. it's the combustion of that 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 caused them yeah. to find their way into the permit low those many years ago when it was yeah. written okay yeah i had my the impression i had from tom was that this was boilerplate that was put in commonly in uh in permits and it was something that was in there related to that use of fuel uh, oil in the in the boilers mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to clarify that as to whether it might have something to do with the rendering process. And if it is, if, uh, if any of these are related to the rendering process, would it be possible for the DEC to provide what are allowable emissions of those chemicals from the rendering process and, uh, and then what uh, measurements have been made uh, to date of those from the plant? Maybe the best way for me to answer that for tonight is when, when we go to modernize that permit, we'll take a look at all of those provisions, including whether any of those are obsolete, no longer relevant, confusing, right. <laughs> and try to um, do what clarifications are, are necessary so that you can pick up the permit, read it, and understand it. Right. Okay. Uh, well, I guess the, the question remains, so I mean, can you, can somebody from your office provide for us uh, there were a number of people that were alarmed by this list, and uh -huh. uh, it puts, I think, would put a lot of people at ease to know that it's f something that's uh, obsolete, that it was, that they're no longer, you're not using that fuel oil anymore for the you boilers. It's completely oil. natural gas now, so this was something that was, again, to uh, Andy's point, something from 1999 that doesn't apply now. But if any of these do relate to the rendering process, can you identify those for us? We're, we're not experts in this, and I'd like to know which of these are related to the rendering process, and then what the allowable amounts are for any of them that do relate to the rendering process, uh, and then if there have been any measurements to date of those, uh, if, if those three items could be provided. Now, maybe, Maybe they're not related to the rendering process, and that's that's okay. But if the if these are related to the rendering process, we'd like to know. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. I'm going to make a chemi out of you yet, <laughs> instead of just an IT guy. <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, any other uh, speakers? Any second time speakers? First time speakers? Okay, um, I'd like to just uh, take an opportunity for those that are remaining, and then those that will be seeing this on a tape uh, rebroadcast. Uh, thank you for uh, all of your attendance. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to uh, recognize and uh, thank uh, the Monroe County Health Department, Dr. Byron Kennedy, uh, the uh, Region 8 Director, uh, Paul Diamato, and uh, Bill Schmieder for uh, being here as well. Uh, there's a couple of uh, action items that uh, that we've captured as a result of this, and uh, certainly are a couple of things that uh, Director uh, and I need to have some uh, conversation on. We'll do that, and then uh, we'll provide uh, an update uh, back through uh, the email uh, list that uh, that is out there. And I've uh, uh, asked in, in my note that I sent out Friday if anyone would like to be deleted from that, fine. If anyone would like to be added to that, uh, fine and uh, we'll make sure that uh, we uh, take care of that as well. Uh, seeing no further speakers, uh, I'll declare this 
uh, public information meeting uh, adjourned. Uh, thank you very much again for attending. Uh, thank you for your time and interest.